Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Let's begin because actually there are people still coming in and we didn't know we had to wait. But the conference, as we all know, is going to be um, streamed online. So people are already waiting at home. So I know that it is never something pleasing to be sitting down at home in front of a computer with things not going on on time as they should. So we're here quite comfortable, but at home it's a different situation. So we've decided to start now. So thank you so much for coming um, this very great day. We hope it'll be interesting for you what we're going to be sharing here today. I hope it is. So to begin with, we're going to start talking about COBAS for a little while. I just wanted to tell you where we find ourselves after uh, over a year since we were created. Uh, 20 to 2.5 billion under management, 10.2 CUIs and pension plans, and 22,500 participants. Some some news we have actually covered the milestones that we had on our roadmap with regards to pension plans available for all of our clients. We have a concentrated fund, which is uh, the best, actually the best ideas that we have, and it should be more profitable um, when compared to your usual funds and and the CCAF, which has some interest for some institutional investors who would rather invest in a CCAV um, instead of an investment fund. So the products that we have are well known by everyone. We have the same ones here and in Luxembourg. And that's how we cover the range of funds that we wish to have. And as we've always said, we have a limited range of, of products, and we decide how we decide how to assign the investment on each fund without complicating the investment decision for those who come to us. I'm talking about our clients and investors in our funds. So we also have some institutional mandates from our um, from institutional. Clients, we also have very, very important funds amongst our 22,000 participants, and we admit clients with uh, just with minimum investment. Uh, with the minimum we um, ask for is 100 euros, and that has made for this heterogeneous um, situation. We have some investments who are under 18 years of age, and that makes us quite happy because it just gives us certainty for the future. And something that is very, very interesting as well is the fact that in this year, which has been a bit weird, complicated, I'd say, we've had clients who have shown their trust in everything that we do, not just on a monthly basis, but every day of the year. We've had clients trusting in us from the beginning, and we've been getting new clients and new entries of investment in our funds. So we, as a company, are where we wanted to be a year and a half ago, and we have a wonderful team. We've already talked about them last year, and it hasn't changed much. And we are willing to keep on doing what we're doing, working so that we can increase the value of your savings. And now let's go to the next slide, the evolution of our three portfolios. And let's just go through the international portfolio, the one in Spain and the one for key accounts or big companies. So these savings, as you can see, in the last uh, year has n have not really gone up. Um, these are data from March 31st, but they have improved now a bit. After a year, after the year 2017, which was reasonably good, 10% profitability, 10% yield, although the exchange rates were against us, 4%. So we had um, a store picking that was somehow buffered by the, by the exchange rate, by currencies. But last year, we had covered our dollar since May at 111. But the lack of coverage during the first months, which we could not um, have, and the impact of other currencies due to the the strength of euro gave us that minus 4%. So in the end, we have we have seen that increase disappear during the first semester due to two um, companies, uh, at least where there have been some seasonal problems that have influenced in our have had an influence in our results, and we will talk about that in depth later on. So we are the same starting point as we were last year, although a bit better because at closing closing now today we will have an evaluation of 103, 104. So it'll be a bit better than the starting point, but with uh, without 
without great improvements. And in the end, in order to just uh, clarify a couple things, as we saw last year, we had an impact uh, due to currency. We have a very concentrated portfolio. Our 10 main values are 50 percent of our portfolio. So a movement in any of them will have an impact on the fund's valuation in, in general, as we saw during the months of November and December, where we had a 15% increase of the value and then the drops in the during the first quarter of the year. That's what this concentration entails. We have a concentrated portfolio because we think that finding new ideas and good ideas is not, is not easy. And when you do find them, you have to first study them well and then take your position with significant position. So it's not very easy to find uh, euros at 50 cents as we are finding currently. So as we can see, our, the value of the different companies, um, it's not something that we can work on. It depends on other values in the market. But we have been working with regards to the net asset value. We are working on the value of the funds. And the target value of the funds is double what they are currently um, getting in the stock. So we see that March last year, when we started with our international portfolio, we started with 157 as our target value. And currently, although we have somehow gone down in Arista and other companies, we are around 192. 192 euros per share. That's our target value. So twice as much as we currently have, because we have 96 right now. And some of you might think that these are bad companies, but that's not true. We are only in, we are investing in commodities and and some companies that have a low capital return because that's where the market is taking us to, and because good companies are very expensive. But the return on capital for average companies is 25 percent, which is a very very good return on capital. And if we if we take out we're including commodities here, but if we take um, maritime shipping values and and commodities and raw materials, we would be talking about a third of our portfolio. And the other two thirds represent 35% of uh, return over capital. So it's, um, it's uh, a per eight return. So a year with not, uh, not an outstanding result, but a very good result with regards to what we can control, which is the target value and the evaluation of the, the funds. We we can always uh, consider that uh, we don't really know how these values are being calculated. But the reality is that those values that we have defined a long time have actually been fulfilled. There are always there have always been exceptions because we obviously have made mistakes. But it is true that with time we have seen that those values that we had in our portfolios five years ago, and when we see the current valuation, we see that the target values in our case, because we are cautious, are usually fulfilled. Well, they're usually met. La cartera internacional no ha variado mucho, quizás el now, as for the national portfolio, we have reduced the position in chemical. It has actually had a very good result. I'm sorry, the international portfolio. So we have we have reduced in Israel and have purchased in another fertilizers company that also interests us to try and maintain the same weight in that sector. And we have increased our position in international seaweeds, which is um, shipping an oil shipping company that we'll talk about later on. And I'm sure that you will all understand understand why we increased our position there. As you can see, the portfolio is a, is a portfolio that has 10 values that represent 50% of the portfolio. We have concentrated our position in all of these um, companies because we really believe in those companies. We have tried to break, and break them down into five big blocks that cover 78% of the portfolio. Places where we have found value in this last year and a half. The first one is in the shipping sector. 
We had never before um, invested in, in ships and shipping. Uh, my father was a maritime engineer, but he'd never had an influence in me in that sense. This is new for us. I've already explained that in the world of investment, you have to be vigilant. You have to know what goes around, and you have to follow up closely or from afar all the different sectors. You cannot be expert in everything, but as soon as there is a sector that for some reason catches your eye, you have to focus on it, and you have to try and learn a maximum about that sector. We will have a short video about how we started in the sector with one company, and we ended up investing in, in a couple of companies up to 25% of our portfolio in shipping. So as you can see, it has a very interesting characteristic, which is the fact that you can measure it in many different ways. We've measured it here according to five-year-old um, Oil, oil shippers, which is a minimum historical resale price. And we're not just in the low side of the cycle in some companies. Half of our exposure is with companies is with companies that have long-term agreements. So we don't have a seasonal risk. We have the risk of not getting paid by the person with which we have um, agreed upon the shipping. So we've talked about the fact that we have um, LNG 15-year long agreement. So it's not a problem of raw materials. It's not about LNG going up or down. And the other half does have a raw material component. It's either steel or scrap or whatever we want to call it. But it's uh, the hulk of the ship. So half of the shipping could be raw materials. I'm talking about the parts and pieces. We're talking about um, international seaways that we will talk about later on. It's uh, our greatest investment. And then in other um, raw materials, we have 12% or 11%, sorry. So we have around 20% in raw materials. And of other raw materials, we would be talking about fertilizing um, products. And the clearest example is ICL with, potas with potassium. We have seen what potassium looked like 10, 15 years ago. And now it is at a um, historical minimum um, a price where no one could uh, have new capacity and in order to exploit new mines. So we are at a minimum for most fer fertilizers. So this is the reasoning behind investing a third of our portfolio in raw materials, because the rest of the 20-15% is not raw materials. It is long-term agreements, never mind if it is a ship or a road or, or whatever it is. It is a long-term agreement. We will talk about who we're signing these agreements with. So it's not really a raw material. It's a third of the portfolio. And someone might say, well, you said, and you said in your book that we were not dealing with raw materials. And it's true. It's true. But what happens is, and that's what we try to do. But in the end, in our day to day in the market, we sit down and we have to think and see that there are cheap companies, expensive companies, and very good companies are very, very expensive. And we will talk about Aditya. So, for instance, a food sector, they are 28, um, Nestle is uh, 22. So, big companies, we all know it. They have a very high per. So, it's scandalous the price that we pay for them. So, we have to look for things while the market is still expensive, where they have gone through problems, and there's where we can offer offer capital because they need it. So we are offering capital in those sectors where they are now seeing that their old investors are worth withdrawing their capital. Because if you put your investment in places where there is abundance of capital, you know where it will end. So when you give capital to those who are looking for it, it will always give you good news. That is why we're investing a third of our portfolio in raw materials. Now, another sector, another important sector where we are, have invested is in the automotive vector, uh, sector. And Andres and, um, has already explained the Renault case. And automotive companies are um, going through a different, difficult situation due to Tesla or the American cycle. We don't know what the reason is. Maybe it's those two elements and others have been going through a rough patch for three years. They have had bad results in the stock. They all have treasury. They all have cash flow. They have a good positioning. The sector is being restructured. For instance, General Motors just sold Opel. Peugeot have done impossible things in France. So it is a sector where things are being changed. It's true, for instance, Fiat has left Italy, something that we, that is unheard of. So we are in a new line in the sector with very attractive companies that are being penalized, that are being punished. So we have 10% of our portfolio in sectors which we believe have uh, to 
to be given a chance, we think it is worth it, and with, um, with an important potential as well. Now, the fourth area um, of focus is the United Kingdom. Sad, sadly, we are attracted by that which does not attract anyone else for the good and the bad. But um, a month ago, there was um, um, an article published at the Financial Times that made me quite happy. Global investors have, have the lesser exposure to the UK than ever and less exposure face compared to other countries. They have more exposure in Zimbabwe than in the UK. So that just comes to prove of our, our attitude investing in the UK. As you can see here, and here we have the graph of the two main companies we have in our fund in the UK. It's Dixon's, and Dixon has gone down 60% since, uh, Brex uh, since three years ago before Brexit, and it there is a free fall of 30%. And at the same time, the pound also has gone down 20%. So we are purchasing assets in the UK that are around 60 to 70% cheaper in some cases, or 40, 50% cheaper than they used to be in other cases. And no one has an interest uh, to buy in the UK. Well, we think that most, uh, most bad news are always around prices. We don't know how the uh, Brexit will go, but usually buying when no one wants to buy is usually in the long term good good policies. So that is why 16% of our portfolio is invested in the UK in pounds. And we also invest in Asia 15%. We explain that. We have tried to explain it. And I'm going to invite Minkun Chan so that he can tell us personally the reason why. Since he's here, uh, he will tell us what we do in Asia and why uh, despite the distance, it is so interesting for us to invest over there. Hola. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I am Min Kun. I'm an analyst for Cobas in Asia. I'm sorry, but I'm going to switch to English. So please, if you need to, please use your headphones, your translators. So you will have to listen to in English for a while. Uh, so um, next uh, slide, maybe. So today, uh, I'm trying to. Uh, okay, I see here. So today I'm trying to uh, summarize to you, okay, okay, yeah. I, I try to summarize to you uh, why 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 we pre why Copas presents in in Asia. So uh, it has been my f uh, tenth years here, and uh, I start working with uh, Paco since 2008, and, and one of the big uh, initiate, initiative initiative. Uh, to present in Asia is that uh, it helped us better to evaluate the non-Asian company in our portfolio. Let me give you an example. Uh, we, uh, BMW was one of the biggest investments that we own uh, by the time. And uh, I was mandated uh, to, to, to go to China uh, and base there to visit their factory in, in China and talk to their joint venture partner uh, in China. Uh, and to see how, how the factory was run, is it efficient, or, and what is strategy they have in the joint venture partner. So, uh, this, there is a little bit different uh, from uh, you reading a report uh, from the broker because there's a second hand information. And when you talk with a joint venture partner, you can sense uh, whether they have uh, uh, intention or potential to steal the technology from BMW, for example. So uh, these kind of uh, small things will not going to appear in the PN, in a, um, financial statement in next two or three quarter, but these are very important question for the long term uh, to know. So this is an example uh, why we want to present in Asia in the very beginning. Um, with time, uh, what we do normally is to compare the competitors. Uh, for example, we invest in a company A, we try to find a competitor in Asia, uh, all the others, and then compare their uh, performance uh, with time. So we get a very good sense of uh, the market share changing, etc. And with this, we actually expand our investable uh, scope uh, into a bigger uh, area uh, in Asia, etc. Uh, so 
uh, as a conclusion, uh, this helps us to in expand our uh, invest invest investment scope and also there create some uh, research synergy. You can compare similar business, business in different parts of the world, and sometimes there's some valuation difference that we can take advantage on. So I'm going to give you a very short um, um, summary of the companies uh, we invest now in Asia. So uh, in our portfolio, uh, global international portfolio, we have 12 companies, and 10 of them is uh, net cash position, very good uh, balance sheet, super safe. And uh, 11 of them is controlled by a family. So this is what our style, we like family who, who kind of generate long-term uh, value. And uh, as a whole, this 12 company has a rosé of more than 30% and the trading at a free cash flow yield of 30% uh, and uh, PER less than five times and with uh, more than 100% upside. And the, you can see uh, four of them here. I, I will very give you a very short uh, introduction of everything. Uh, so first of all, uh, starting from the left, uh, Samsung. Uh, it is a technology company and um, they, they, last year, 2017, it make uh, more or less 40 billion uh, US dollar uh, free cash flow. Out of that, 60% is made with uh, semiconductors. So it's a little bit complicated, but think uh, in your mobile phone, your TV, in your PC, you have a lot of semiconductor, uh, especially memories. And 60% of profit is from the semiconductor. 20% from mobile, that is easy to understand. And the other 10% uh, plus uh, from display, which is the panel on your mobile phone. So why, why, do, we, why do we invest in a technology company? It's not uh, our core of, uh, circle of competence. Uh, because um, this company uh, with 40 billion free cash flow, uh, they are trading at less than five times um, market, uh, um, uh, PE after the net cash and the non-call. So this is extraordinary. And on top, this is a very good uh, business. Uh, they have been generating 20 to 30 percent, we'll say, uh, throughout the cycle, and he has been a leader uh, in what he's doing. Uh, for example, in this very important uh, memory business, uh, it's a global leader, and there's only two or three guys uh, playing uh, in that field. And it's very clearly uh, for a logical person to understand why Samsung has been doing better than others, because it requires a lot of investment to make a generation uh, ad advance uh, when you are developing the next generation uh, semiconductor. So imagine that will be a billion level uh, billion US dollar level investment. And w w with that, Samsung have a lot of uh, uh, R&D uh, uh, um, investment and compared to the next two guys, uh, which is much less than 50, um, 50%. Percent. So uh, in the long term, you can imagine this guy have more pocket, more cash to invest, and the, the business just require more investment for the future. So this is something we can easily follow and we can easily understand, and the upside and the risk is very favorable to us. And Hyundai, uh, you must know it's an automaker we have presented uh, a couple of years ago. So uh, still, uh, it is an uh, automaker with uh, selling about uh, 5 million cars globally in six countries. They are not, not only selling in Korea or, or US, they are selling globally. And uh, 50 to, uh, about half of those volume goes to emerging market. Uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, China, they have some decent market share in those uh, growth market. So this is important. And second thing is, uh, there's a family behind, and for the last decades, the family has been showing a great uh, record of creating value. They bring this uh, local uh, Korean automaker to global stage and become a number four, number five, or number six global player. So um, we have to give them some credit. And on, on the other hand, um, we estimate conservatively they probably can generate four billion cash, sorry, four billion free cash flow this uh, next year, and this bring the preferred shares below three times earnings, which is incredible. And next one, uh, Daiwa. So what is this? It is a Japanese uh, commercial refrigerator producer. 
And, um, and imagine in the kitchen or restaurant, you have a refrigerator. And if that's broken, uh, you need somebody come to your uh, restaurant right away to fix it. So this is a very, very good business. They are generating 40 to 50% uh, of Rosé uh, throughout the time. And this is not only for them, it's for many other peers. We, we research uh, global peers, we re research Japanese uh, competitors. They all generate very good uh, Rosé. So uh, we conclude this is a very good business. And there's a family behind, net cash position, and excluding the cash, the share is trading at uh, uh, less than three times. So it's also very incredible to find these kind of things um, in Japan. So we decide we invest. And Fujitech, uh, this is the number four elevator player uh, in Japan, but they also have very, some, some very important uh, market share, market position in, in Asia, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, those kind of mature markets where the service can actually create a very good uh, um, uh, uh, rosé business, high rosé business. Uh, we estimate about 80% of the profit uh, is coming from this kind of uh, either very mature, very good business. So it's a good business. Again, with a family behind, net cash position, a business that we like, we invest in the past. So we have been following the industry for a long while. So we feel comfortable investing in them. Uh, just last one, maybe I want to mention, um, we also recently uh, invest in uh, Korean Telecom. Uh, this is uh, Telefonica in Korea. Um, why do we invest in them? Because um, they have good assets. Imagine, um, because of the historical reason, they have some of the best location uh, of the land uh, in, in the center of a city. They have the, the widest uh, fiber network coverage of the whole country, just like the phone car. You can think of Telefonica as an example. Um, um, they, 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 they could generate uh, 700 billion and uh, trading at 10 times PE, so it's quite cheap uh, compared to what uh, uh, the asset can generate uh, in, in the future potential. Um, so, yeah, we like the, the idea and we, we are part of it. So, that's it, and I will return the floor to Paco. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Min Kun. So obviously you will be able to ask as many questions as you wish at the end of the presentation. I'm sorry, someone is telling me something. Let's see what they want me to know. Yes, that's what I was going to say. Yes. So please write down your questions if you want to ask them. And Santiago Cortes and Jama Martin will come up to stage and ask those questions to all of us. And I think you can also send your questions um, remotely if you're connected through the streaming. So we're going to talk now about Iberia and, and we will afterwards talk about the portfolio in general. So Iberia has behaved quite well, 10% since we started. And the when the index were uh, flat, they, they were zero during this year when we were working on this portfolio, the Iberian portfolio. And the good news here is that the target value, the value that the fund has, we also have managed to push it up uh, little by little. And it is now at around 159 per share, which is uh, less than we have in the international portfolio. But we've always said that it will be more difficult to generate value in Spain because there are less values to work with. So so we came from uh, from the mud, and uh, there's not much to be done in the mud. So we have just approved, and we have just communicated to the participants a change in the fund, so that we can now invest in companies that might have their assets in Spain, even if they're not listed in Spain. There are some cases, and I will not be able to mention them now, but there is a company, a very traditional Spanish company that is managed by Spanish managers that is listed in London. And I said, well, well we should be able to purchase this, even if they're not listed in Spain. So there, we're going to try and enlarge our portfolio in that sense so that we can give more value to the Iberian portfolio. So very good companies, we have here, have them here. 27% result of the fund this year, 27% uh, rosy, so good value. And the portfolio hasn't changed much. We can say that the last few years something of uh, 
funny has happened. We saw that the 10 main values only have one Portuguese uh, company, but five, six years ago, it was the Portuguese values that dominated this landscape. So the reality is that Portugal Portugal as a company, as a country, sorry, has been behaving quite well, their values very well, but the reality is that in in same conditions we'd rather invest in Spain because it's closer, we are closer to the companies and it is easier to find value in Spain than in Portugal because the, the farthest it is from you, the more difficult it is to manage. So there are some small values that we had never worked with. It was Quabit uh, Real Estate and then Grupo Sentis for telecommunications and the rest are just uh, values that you know all too well that have been in our portfolio for a very long time, uh, more or less. in, in amount but they've always been present and if we talk about large corporates and their portfolio well here we're also in square one and it is true that in this area uh, the global index hasn't behaved too he behaved too well in the last year and uh, the portfolio is behaving like the index but in reality we're very well surprised by our achievements we have managed to obtain a lot of value from uh, this fund a uh, large corporate fund as you know 20 to 25 5 percent of them are smaller uh, companies Aritza and others but uh, the backbone of this fund are uh, companies that have uh, more than 4 billion in market cap and finding values that allow us to obtain 179 percent value and an 80% uh, valuation or appreciation potential, that is actually quite satisfying. And these um, stocks are indeed given very good results for our funds with the passing of time. And the quality of companies is really good, uh, our ROSI of uh, 27%, and the price is uh, PR8 or nine when the market is uh, listed at uh, this level of pair we're talking about the half the price indeed and uh, these are the main stocks in the fund for our big company a large corporates portfolio as we see here many stocks do coincide they do match because uh, the most important are uh, stocks that we are very well acquainted with and therefore they we are invested in the large corporate portfolio too like Aritza and others but most importantly we have three pharma companies that we will elaborate on later on so Shire, Teva and Mylan and uh, KT Corp that uh, our colleague from Asia talked about. They're from Korea and they're listed at uh, two times EBITDA. If uh, Telefonica is at four times and KT is at two times the EBITDA, so the price is actually absurd. I think this portfolio is going to yield a very good outcomes. It's quite defensive and in reality, it's uh, It has come as a big surprise, too. We wanted to also uh, play a video now. And when we were talking earlier about the maritime sector, we were uh, considering how uh, that we had to reply how we have had one quarter of our, our portfolio in the maritime sector. So with this video, we want to explain how we have come to this position. So play video. Good afternoon, Andres and Juan. I would like to ask you some of the questions that our co-investors ask us. The first question is the following. How did you come up with this investment idea to invest in the raw material sector? Well, by the end of 2016, we detected that the raw material sector was still punished by the market, specifically the oil and gas sector. And because of that, we started looking around and trying to find new investment possibilities. And on the basis of a conversation, a formal conversation that we held with a company, we detected that the maritime transportation of raw material sector for oil, gas, and LNG was specially punished. And therefore, we uh, found uh, an investment possibility, which was TK. How has this evolved towards including other companies in the sector in your portfolio, such as tankers, uh, produ uh, producers of LNG, and so on? Well, that 
goes back to what Juan said earlier on. We were analyzing a company and uh, we started to drill down and we found many things that uh, the market doesn't realize because they're very niche. First, we analyze uh, the value chain of the company. So we try to understand who are their competitors and we come to realize that there's companies that do similar things and they're good and they could be good investments too. This is why we invested in Dynagas, for example. And then we started looking around the broader value chain and that the company is part of. And we did this uh, jointly because Juan is very well acquainted with some areas and I asked Juan uh, what he thought about several things. And there we came to find GTT and we also found uh, gas producing companies and that's how deep we dug and we found very many niche things. We're not very dogmatic. We don't have uh, very important assumptions in terms of weights, but what we try to do is to find things with a lot of potential and very low risk. And if those factors appear in the sector, we will remain in the sector. And if they appear elsewhere, we'll go to that sector. It depends on the opportunity. Thank you very much. And thank you for your time. Thank you. We resume our presentation now, and going back to what we have just seen, I would like to make a brief comment about TK LNG, one of our greatest investments. On the one hand side, uh, the headquarters uh, have uh, the, have launched a capital increase with direct appreciation with approximately 20% of the capitalization. They have uh, swapped 20% of the debt for 20% capitalization. The market didn't like it. We didn't. We wouldn't have done it either. But it's a company that has uh, undergone a very deep crisis in the last three to four years, with a sharp drop of oil prices. And the owners, the managers, have decided um, to go down a uh, profile uh, with. Um, with a lower risk. And of course, fear is free. So they have indeed uh, gotten rid of some uh, risk for the headquarters and uh, the reduction for reevaluation hasn't ha hasn't received a lot of impact. Instead of 20 euros, we may be talking about 18 euros. The company is now listed at eight or nine euros, so the potential for revaluation is very high indeed. And in the meanwhile, the subsidiary um, TK uh, uh, TGP, which is the main reason why we're invested in this group, continues on with their investment plan and they have very long term contracts. Here we have a slide from the company presented in the last quarter in February and they were talking about the previous year and this is the same plan that they have had for five years indeed. These are the ships that are going to uh, be commissioned this year. This is the investment plan that they have in place and this is the reason why they decided to cut back on dividends a couple of years ago uh, to finance this without any type of problem and all ships have uh, contracts reflected on the uh, bluebirds. Uh, Charters IP is the name of the contractor and uh, Shell has contracted nine of them. BP has contracted another one. Uh, Gemmark is a joint venture uh, from Total, uh, including Russians and Chinese. They have gotten another long-term contract with the ships. The shorter-term contracts are the ones at the top, which are with Shell. There's a couple of that last a few, um, a couple of years, uh, but the others are uh, for more years. We're talking about fixed company uh, contracts here, and the possibility of uh, default for this company is uh, reduced to. Uh, to the minimum level. So the plan continues as it stands that what the company has uh, declared is that with this new ship said uh, they hope to generate 225 extra free cash flow and this would take us to between 800 and 900 free cash flow and they would devote 450 approximately to pay in debt and uh, they're paying out their shareholders. We are considering that it will be about 200 and 250, partly in dividends, partly in new projects, which are more profitable than paying out dividends. So we're talking about 200 and 250 million for the shareholders. And at this moment in time, we're paying for this company 1.4 billion. And uh, please remember 
or note uh, the term of these contracts. So this company has a very good potential. And as usual, we consider that this type of investments are an industrial project. We are putting $1.4 billion on the table. Now we'll start getting 200, 215 starting next year. So in seven years, we will repay the investment and we'll have another 10 or 15 extra years uh, to get uh, even more profit. It's an investment project. Normally, the market will acknowledge this sooner than later. Here we have another example, which is international seaways. We have 7% of our portfolio invested in oil transportation uh, companies. This market is a bit more complicated than the previous one. We're talking about long-term companies uh, with very sound counterparties, counterparties uh, low risk and uh, limited profitability. But the oil sector is a sector that goes into currency bankruptcy, and it's a very volatile market. International Seaways, it's the greatest exposure that we have right now. It amounts to 3.6% of our portfolio. We have uh, 7.3, including the three companies that work in the oil transportation business. We're going to see what the price of of, uh, of uh, fleeting oil is right now. A couple of months ago, it was $2,000 per day. Instead of uh, renting a yacht this year in uh, Mallorca, I would consider uh, renting a tanker because uh, for two thousand dollars a day that price doesn't even cover the cost the market is at a very complex moment right now and that is causing for the first three months of the year to have a uh, 17 or 18 uh, um, uh, boats VLCCs uh, and they have been sent to scrapyards and that has happened in only three months and so no one can complete uh, compete with these fleets and the older boats need to be considered scrap so we consider that in principle this uh, context is attractive but we are trying to find companies that will survive this cycle and that could be beneficial whenever the cycle is reverted and this is why international seaways is specially present at the others too but most importantly international seaways because it's a very illustrative case we're we're going to talk about figures because the case is actually beautiful it's worth uh, five million dollars in the stock markets and it's uh, more than 500 million a couple of things could happen that the company is uh, cl shut down tomorrow or that we wait for uh, the company to um, to pick up if we were to sell the fleet uh, tomorrow the value would be one million and these are estimates done by brokers and we're doing this boat by boat because uh, when one of these boats is 20 years old uh, you send it to scrap and uh, you get 80 million dollars so uh, this amounts to 80 million dollars so if you take into account all the different boats it's like playing real estate here. You, it's actually better than the real estate sector because here boats uh, suffer a depreciation every year and after 20 years the boats or their ships are worth nothing. So you need to renew the fleet constantly. So the sector needs to pick up because otherwise the fleet wouldn't be renewed. At any rate, if we were to sell tomorrow morning our uh, ships at market price, unsurprisingly in the maritime market, they have a very liquid situation. There's always a counterparty for a boat. And the prices are very accurate. An oil tanker can be uh, such scrap for $20 million, and that's considered a good price. But for $17 uh, million, that's not a good price. So the ranges, the ranges are very tight. There aren't any great surprises in this sense. So that 1.1 that's the value of the fleet, could be 1.1, 1.15, 1.2, but it should be around that uh, level. And then they have uh, some joint ventures in the long term with gas, and, and they're worth 400 million, and uh, they're offset by debt. With non-ship assets, the debt would be offset. So there are there isn't much risk here, and you can actually sell these assets. There's no financial risk. So if we were to sell 
the fleet right now, uh, we would get double the its price. Would the company do it right now? Well, I don't think it would do it. We're not asking the company to do it. It would be interesting, nevertheless, because at that point in time, we would double our investment and we would make be make it 3.5% uh, for our fund overnight. I'm not saying that this is not going to happen, but we must take into account that the um, main shareholders in this company own uh, 15%. John Paulson has 15%, and he is the one that actually profited uh, from uh, the, the, the fall of the real estate market in the US because he knew what he was talking about. And then some other American hedge funds have a, a large share. They don't want to have a larger fleet, fleet in this sense. They want to make money, these investors. So is the company going to be shut down? Is it going to be settled? Well, we don't think so, because normally the situation will stabilize in the fleet market in a year time or 15 months, and the capability of this company of generating Profit is what we see to the right, uh, 450 in revenue in a standardized environment at a price uh, that is interesting uh, for uh, people to build oil tankers. If we take into account the age of the fleet, 140 million in free cash flow multiplied by 12, because this is a commodity sector, and we are talking about 1.7 billion. That's how much the fleet would be worth, and we're paying 500 billion for, uh, million for it. So we would be tripling or doubling our investment. So we're talking about doubling or tripling or more. And why does this happen? Because that's the way markets work. And this is why we like these markets personally. I have a lot of fun with this. And uh, this is how we create uh, value in the long term. This company has been listed in the stock market for just one year because it was a spin-off that stemmed from another company. And the shareholders of the previous company have joined this company. So they didn't have to do any marketing campaigns or anything of the like. They just um, they were listed, and that's it, and that's all. And um, the value is 500 million. It's uh, the maritime sector doesn't have any companies in it, and normally they're a small. And the market doesn't really follow this type of um, sector. But when things go well, and the market starts uh, noticing, so we have a good position in in this fund. And now I would like to talk about the company that has had a greater impact this year, and I would like to explain what has happened. Last year, the company um, had a 10% profitability, 9.5% of our profitability came from Maritza, and this year it's about 8 well, it was 4.5% at the end of Q1, and we owe that to Aritza in negative terms. And uh, here we see what has happened to the company. We have had a position which is depicted by the gray light uh, line, which is a uh, uh, nine point something of the portfolio, uh, with a listing of uh, 30 euros. And that's the average. At a moment in time, in November, we started to see that the restructuring process and the changes that the company is undergoing are uh, bearing fruit, and the listing, uh, the stock price went from 30 to um, near 40, and we sold part of our position, and we reduced the weight to 8% as a... Uh, price goes up, we reduce the weight because the potential decreases, of course. And there was a profit warning that, that uh, we're going to talk about now. The company was foreseen to generate uh, 450 million in EBITDA, but it's going to generate three, three, 330 this year. And they issued the profit warning. And from eight, we want to have in 6.6%. Uh, and we have uh, um, gone back to these prices. And we have uh, rebought the shares that we had previously lost or sold. This is how we act. This is how we behave. We consider the value of the company, and we act according to the different movements experienced by the company. If the company um, experiences a certain movement, uh, that is um, goes away from what uh, we consider it should be the value for the company, then we per we go for a buy position. And now we're going to explain uh, what has happened and what we can expect from the company now. What the company said in January, and by the way, this was the first company in the world practically to say this. Therefore, it came as a big surprise for everybody. They said that the increase in uh, transportation and personal costs in the U.S. was not... Uh, 
being reflected in the price uh, that uh, customers paid because of how quickly this had happened. They said that they were going to make 430 million in November, and we are talking about what ha that the statement happened in uh, January. In a couple of months, the price of transportation incre increased by 25 percent in some areas in the U.S. What's happening with transportation in the U.S.? Well, from now on, actually, from one of these days on, all drivers are obliged to. Uh, measure through electronic means uh, how long they're driving. So as a result, companies have had to adapt to this and the cost of transportation is slowly increasing and it's actually peaking. It peaked in uh, December and January. At the same time, the implementation of a minimum wage in many um, U.S. states and the fact that uh, unemployment is at 4 percent, it's um, causing salaries uh, to experience ex strong, strong um, increases in unqualified workforces. And we're talking about a new sector. Uh, we're talking about a new management, and they're trying to change the company, but the company hasn't still been able to um, reflect this problem on their prices. And many companies in the sector have done the same. Actually, here we have an example, which is General Mills. It's uh, an enormous uh, food company in the US. And they uh, experienced a happens a drop a few days ago because of the same reason, because costs were increasing markedly, and they weren't being able to pass this on to customers. And most companies are talking to their customers so that they can increase prices. And this is something that will possibly cause inflation in the U.S. when all these uh, prices are passed on to the end consumers. So all this has uh, uh, had as an impact a very big delay in the presentation of results. And the expected free cash flow is going to be uh, not what we expected. We all expected 200 or so. In this context, we have uh, some negative news, but also some reasonably positive news for the company. They have had some problems with customers, customers who determined that they were going to manufacture their own bread, and their sales and volumes are being stabilized this year. The impact is not significant yet, but in Europe we see that it's becoming stable and prices are starting to increase. The business is quite good. Actually, this year we're talking about a 20% of uh, return on capital employed, and this is actually quite a good business. They have a very good management team. The chairman is something that we have already discussed. We've known him for many years. He was the general uh, manager for Smurfit Kappa. Um, and he's a wonderful professional. And then the CEO, we also have very good references about him. And I'm sure that all together they will put, uh, they will create a very good restructuring team and they will be successful. And it's a company that, as a consequence of what has happened, has um, incurred a very important debt. They're selling assets. They yet haven't sold their most important non core assets, which is Picard, which is a subsidiary of the French company, it would be worth about 200 million. And if they manage to sell it with that, they would drastically reduce any financial risk that they could have. And we need to recall that net of this uh, sale, Picard, they have a company of 9.2 million in debt. 1.9 million in debt, and they could indeed uh, uh, hold their uh, cash for quite a few years if they determine to do so. So they have a tight financial situation, but it's relatively under control. And we must recall that Telefonica has. Uh, do you remember how many hybrids uh, Telefonica has? It's five million. Eight billion. So 20% of uh, what Telefonica has, it's hybrids, this type of bonds, which are almost bonds, which are almost capital. At any rate, the company now has a market cap of 1.6 billion, uh, net debt uh, if they sell Picard of 1.9, and sales of 3.6. So they're at one-time sales in the listing. The free cash flow that they're generating this year, net of, uh, extra of uh, uh, one-offs, it's uh, 90 million. They're uh, listed at uh, 10 times free cash flow right now. So we consider that the potential, because we always need to consider the worst case scenarios, but we need to consider that the potential of them 
crashing. It's very small. What do we expect from this company? Well, under normal conditions in this uh, restructuring process, it's a company that was already making 350, uh, 250, 350 free cash flow. And they're in a very easy business. There is selling uh, uh, frozen bread to many million customers, but uh, they're having a very good result. So here we have two possibilities, two scenarios. Margins don't pick up, the company doesn't pick up, and they're still at uh, the current level. And it's impossible for them to reduce their earnings more because the quality of their business selling 3.6 uh, million billion, it's actually um, what it is. But if we assume 15 times uh, the revenue, we add that to, uh, to 250 million, that gives us 29 euros per share, and that is our purchasing price. We wouldn't have had a uh, good profitability with this operation, but we wouldn't have lost. And right now, it's 40% uh, revaluation in a normal scenario in which m margins were actually at some point of 15 percent now they're currently at 10 percent or so but if we assume that they go to 18 to 13 we were talking about uh, uh, 18 million free cash flow 15 times uh, 48 uh, uh, years per share we're trying to be cautious, uh, but many things can happen. But we're talking about a 100% appreciation potential. Not as much as we expected back in the day, but the appreciation is actually quite important. We don't see things in a different scenario. If there was a capital increase, they would have uh, um, fewer debt, less debt, and more capital. It wouldn't be the end of the world. But we don't think this is going to happen because we know the chairman and we know the situation that the company's in. And I would like to compare this company with a couple of companies. One is not here, but they're their main competitor in the sector. By the way, they're world leaders in what they do, so there aren't many benchmarks. There is a company called Flower Foods in the US. They do something uh, similar. Uh, frozen, They sell frozen bread, but they do other things too. But it's nice to compare them because of this size, because they're very similar. This company has a, it's in the stock market at $4.5 million, vis-a-vis -vis 4.6. They have $800 million in debt. So debt plus market cap, it's $4.5 billion. This company generates $400 billion in a million in EBITDA, similar to what Aritza could be creating now, and 150 free cash flow. Well, actually, it's revenue. It's a bit more free cash flow. So they can be compared in terms of dollars. And the specificity is that they are listed at uh, 5.4 times uh, debt plus uh, market cap, vis-a-vis -vis 543 uh, for its with the same multiples, uh, yeah, Aritza would have an appreciation of 60-70%, uh, an extra uh, 1 billion at 34 $35 uh, dollars per share, which is what, what it was like in January. So this is the main comparison for the US. But here, I would like to introduce a very interesting company, a company that we have held stakes uh, in for a very long time, since so we started with our international fund. And back in the day, uh, we sold it already. But this is a company that is relatively similar. They don't work with frozen bread. They uh, manufacture chocolate, and they sell it to great uh, chocolate manufacturers, uh, Nestle uh, Lint and others. And this company has had very good results with the passing of time. The company, the sector isn't growing much, just like with bread, but the market cap is 8.6 billion euros and a debt of uh, 1 billion. It's a bank debt uh, similar to that of Aditza. So we're paying $8 million for that company. The EBITDA is higher, sales are 6 million, uh, EBITDA is uh, 500 or more. And um, free cash flow is currently 300 million. It's not nice to make comparisons. Uh, you don't always look good on the picture. But uh, here we're talking about a PR of 28 times. That's actually a scandal. Even if we had smoked something funny, 
we wouldn't fi uh, find the possibility, we wouldn't consider the possibility of uh, uh, buying something at uh, PER 28. It's impossible to buy something at PER 28. But there's people who are willing to pay for it, many people actually. And there's many people who pay uh, 10 times uh, the revenue for Aritza. What are we doing? We aren't uh, uh, buying Barrica Levo at this point in time, but we're buying Aritza because of their valuation. Aritza was listed at 90 euro per share three years ago. And that amounts to 8 billion in capitalization. I'm not saying that Barry is going to go to 1.5, but I'm not going to say that Aritza is going to go to, from 1.6 to, to 6. But there's a certain room for maneuver. We'll be at about 1.5, and amounts will be relatively higher. And I think that the business is better in Aritza than in Barri. The Barri business is more commodity-like. They're selling uh, Nestle. They're not selling to McDonald's, but uh, it's uh, quite a minority. Aritza uh, doesn't sell to McDonald's. They don't make money by selling to McDonald's. Um, they make money selling to uh, your corner bakery. We're talking about the typical company that has a temporary problem, and we can indeed uh, harness it moving forward. If you want to ask about any further information about this company later on, I'll be delighted to give you more information. But actually, we did this in December before the profit warning, and we hired a company, uh, a company to do an analysis about the REITs, uh, talking to uh, providers, customers, vendors, employees, former employees. And uh, we didn't do it because we could see a profit warning coming. We did it because at some point in time, we considered that we had to have a sell position, and we wanted to know if we had to sell at 47 or 52, and that's where the value lies. And the conclusion was that the company is good, the business is good, they have a lot of assets, they have made many mistakes, and hopefully the new management team will solve all these mistakes and will do things better. That's the message that uh, they gave us, and the profit warning doesn't really change this message. Actually, we took it as an advantage to buy more shares. We have here a slide where we talk about the emotional uh, approach with regards to investment. And it is something that we want to know in order to do things well. And we hope this will be the graph for Arista in a few years, in a couple years or so. But here we see what happens to us, how we justify things, why we justify that we purchased or why we justify that we want to sell. And it usually is very difficult for us to get back into situations such as this one. And Arista's case is very, it's a bit of, very beautiful one because they have gone from 90 um, Swiss francs to uh, 60, uh, to, to 22 Swiss francs in a couple of years. So no one has actually made money with Arista, no one. So we lost 20% since the beginning. We have uh, gone down one euro per share or so on. So, But some people have lost 70 or 80% of their money. So no analyst who have uh, recommended to purchase in the last few years have really um, understood what was going on. Arista has no friends in the world right now. It's not easy. To, um, to behave as you should in situations such as this one. But as we'll see later on, in order to invest well, you need to be able to assess things as they are and be capable of having the patience to really take benefit from the um, evaluations that we find along the way. And lastly, we're going to talk about the pharmaceutical industry because of all the companies that we have seen, we see that the main characteristic is the fact that uh, there are pharmaceutical companies and we have found three or four or even even more that we have purchased and sold, which for different reasons um, have attractive prices or had attractive prices. Sorry, I forgot this slide. Here we have those those three companies. We purchased them um, the last few months. We had one which was Manteba and uh, Teba. Then um, we have purchased others, and the others have had other behaviors that weren't as bad as Teba's um, behaviors. So every three days in Teba in Milan, they usually have uh, generic drugs. They copy uh, drugs when their patent is over and they're no longer protected, and they have very attractive prices, uh, Teba and Milan. Why? Well, because with Trump 
there has been some some hot debate in the U.S. because in the U.S. the market, the pharma market, is different to the European one. Here, you know, drugs are reasonably cheap, and when you have a generic drug, it's cheaper, but not that much. But in the U.S., drugs are very, very expensive. I remember when I used to travel to the U.S., I saw that everything is cheaper there except for drugs. So usually, drugs are very, very expensive, and when there is a generic drug, the price drops. Um, drastically, so some companies wouldn't wouldn't some companies wouldn't get the price to drop, and then the regu the regulators and pressure groups are forcing them to to have the prices drop. And for instance, in the case of Teva, their prices have gone down 20 to 30 percent um, every year in the last few years. And we who are close to them, we know that they are not going to be manufacturing certain certain drugs. So there is a cyclic component that we are benefiting from, and we are purchasing the leaders in the US and also in Europe and in the rest of the world. They are leaders in the pharma market with very good prices. And in Teva, there is a financial risk, a certain financial risk. But we know that the new managing team, um, led by someone who is Karen Schultz, who is a person we we have uh, the best references from. And then Shire is the other company that we have in our portfolio. This is a company that um, is um, sells brands, original drugs. Uh, protected by patent and they have just announced this week or last week that they are going to get a take um, an offer for takeover from a Japanese company it is uh, an IPO from another company so we will be getting good news from Shire that's what happens with portfolios actually so good things happen when you have cheap companies I remember in 2008 we had uh, th three different takeover bids by different companies important funds wanted to purchase those companies uh, during interesting moments that took place during those years. And then to talk about the Spanish companies, we will talk about Tecnicas Reunidas, which is one of the companies such as Inditex or other Spanish organizations that are faring quite well. They're doing a, an extraordinary job for the Spanish brand the world over. Others do the opposite work. Well, they defend the Spanish brand. And it is a company that uh, deals with engineering in the oil sector, basically. They specialize mainly in uh, refineries, and they are the, the two or they're amongst the two or three best companies in the world. In some areas, they're even the best. They started working 12 years ago with the Yedo family, and well, we have been following them up uh, from up close. We didn't invest in them at the beginning when they IPO'd, but then something happened, uh, something negative, and that's when we bought. And what, that's what we did at that time, and we've done it twice. They have, they are quite cyclic. Sometimes they uh, they get um, uh, contracts granted to them. Sometimes they lose them. Uh, some of the contracts that they had been granted due to political problems in America, in Latin America, they did not get. So the company, in a very healthy way, decided, well, since I did not get these contracts, and I do have two important contracts that are going to give me enough invoicing, I'm not going to start firing engineers and decapitalize a company when I will me needing my engineers in six months' time. So what they did was absorb the, the, the impact, the shock. So instead of having four or five percent margins, they only had two percent margins. The contracts that they expected to come did come, did arrive. So now they should be back on the five percent uh, margin road. And that's what they said. So this is the optimum moment for us to purchase more shares. And, and we have actually set them as the main investment that we have in the Iberian portfolio. So it has a PR10 and no financial risk. So this is a summary of what I wanted to introduce to you with regards to our portfolio, our different portfolios, the funds, what we expect out of them. And as a summary, I from my point of view, I believe we have a wonderful portfolio. As you all know, all my savings are in my funds and in these funds. And I am really happy to have these assets and these values in the portfolio. And the market will be reflecting their value soon. And uh, the advantage is the fact that it is taking longer because some investors will now be able to benefit from that um, with more immediacy than those who entered 10 years ago or two years ago or whenever. So what we're always going to do is uh, taking our target values upwards. For instance, if today we were showing 197 for the international portfolio, next year we'll say it will be 20, 220. So that will allow for 
for the fund to go upwards. And there is a factor that I didn't mention, which is also very important, which is the, the degree of trust that we have in today's assessments is higher than the one that we had a year or a year and a half ago. And it's obviously logical because many of the values uh, we newbies and it's the first time we invested on them and now with time we are getting the knowledge that we didn't have a year and a half ago. So that's the way things go. So I wanted to end my presentation by talking about things that are not strictly investment related but they are very important to us which, is, which have to do with our commitment, our commitment with some other external things and there are two, three things that we want to do that we will do and we will be doing more with time I'm sure but let's talk about what it is that we're doing currently, those that we have already promoted. So we're going to show a couple of videos. The first thing is um, the fact that the analysis services are going to be covered by us. With the MIDFID 2, the cost for the purchasing of a share of Telefonica, which would be uh, 15 basis points, 0 0.15, was absorbed by the fund. It was absorbed by all the clients. But legislation now forces us to separate the trading from the payment for analysis services to the broker when we work for, with Morgan Stanley or with any broker, we pay them uh, 0.15 and they give us that trading and an analysis and an access to companies and a series of things. So now the law forces us to break those down into two and we ha obviously the trading has to be paid by the fund. The trading is a cost of trading, obviously. And the analysis, the um, analysis services will have to be either paid by the managing company or the fund and we have decided to pay it. It could be half of what we were paying. So half is trading and half is analysis services. And that cost, which is um, uh, an important amount, we have decided to, to bear with it. Just like Arista's um, um, analysis, the consultancy service is being paid by the managing company and not by the clients who um, are already paying a high fee, um, a commission that we will be talking about when the time comes. And that's with regards to our commitment of bearing the cost of analysis services. And uh, as we have already said, we have set up two different initiatives. The first one is Value School in order to disseminate financial culture. And it's very important to know how to assess and do it well. But for instance, what I just told you about International Seaways, uh, it's, you'll say it's easy. It's very easy. If I go to preschool and I tell them about this, they'll understand it. I'm going to try with my six-year-old, actually, um, although he's a bit big-headed and he might not want to understand. But it is easy to understand. What's difficult is to take another step and say, I'm going to purchase a, an International Seaways uh, share and see what happens with the ships, with these vessels. That's a very difficult uh, step and it's even more difficult when your shares go drop 25%. That's like standing in front of a cliff. So in order to help people assess and evaluate, but uh, mainly to help have the um, the, the grid necessary to consider those transfers and then those operations. That's why we created Valuesco. But uh, let me just show you a video that summarizes what it is that we're doing and then we will talk about the uh, Open Value Foundation because uh, both in, in Value School and in Open Value Social Fund, we are dedicating much time and we're not doing as much as we would like to because managing different funds, different portfolios takes most of our time, um, most of the team's time. It takes 90-something uh, percent of our time and that's what we do for a living. But we have a great team in Value School that is led by Gonzalo Recarte and um, Open Value Foundation by Ángeles León, Arturo, and the team they have. And well, if we can, we will always lend a hand. But these are initiatives that have their own engine, and they work on their own. Could you please play the Value School video? It's just a two-minute video. Value 
Value School nace con un objetivo muy Value concreto, School was born with a very clear objective, which is trying to improve the financial culture of our society. It is to be a meeting point where investors, analysts, managers can share their uh, knowledge and experiences, contributing to investors having better decisions with regards to their, their investments. That's what we called conscious investment. So we created a content plan that goes beyond learning how to purchase when it's cheap and being patient. Investors need to be aware that they need to save in the long term. They need to know the uh, landscape and they need to know themselves to take good decisions. It is a process, a lear learning process, not a teaching process. And we currently are developing three different strategic lines. On the one hand, our book collection, where we want to really add value to reading as a tool for learning. We have introduced our first five books. For instance, the second book published by Peter Lynch. And the second line is our blog, where each month we um, propose a topic and our community will share their ideas and comments. And the third line of action are our weekly events. It is an open forum where we try to attract talent from different fields, managers, analysts, teachers, and even investors who will share with our whole community their own experiences and visions with regards to the process, the investment process. We are aware of the fact that our um, role would be very much limited if we were only uh, constricted by our uh, physical space. That is why we try for all of our content to be always available from any point through our digital platforms. And at the same time, we are developing a new project, Value Kids. Valley Kids is our investment in financial training for school for kids in schools. We try to tell them about values such as um, responsible consu consumption and savings, always from um, a, a leisurely point of view. And this is possible thanks to the involvement of managers, teachers, investors who have decided to be a part of this project. And we want to thank them, and we would like to invite everyone to be a part of this project. So welcome to the world of conscious investment. Una última cosa sobre Value School. Bueno, creo que es muy interesante. I think this is very interesting. What happens there is very interesting. We are uh, bringing uh, British, French, Spanish investors who will tell us about their experience. Uh, we can invest in some of those cases and some we can't because they have closed funds. But I think it's very interesting. And I really think that we cannot send you information from Value School because the, um, the, the data protection law is very strict, so we can't send anything. So we, I would really encourage you to just register to Value School if you want to receive information regarding the events that we organize and all the publications that we are publishing, everything that we do. I think it's really worth it. I frankly do think it is very much worth it. And lastly, but not least, the Open Value Foundation. We are, as I said, we um, we have 15 percent of the of. COBAS AM, uh, 0.05 of the commission and 15% of our revenue. Not the benefits, but the income are going to be dedicated to two things, which are um, development and investment in impact. I insist that in the fact that this work is much more difficult than the one that we carry out. What we try to do is make as much money as we can for our clients and always requiring uh, companies to respect the law and to do things as they should in a distant way and in the long term. We cannot tell them that we have we have oil companies, we have all sorts of companies. So we are agnostic with regards to sectors. We can't impose our criteria. And I do believe that that needs to be done with the benefits that we get from the funds. So whatever benefit we generate will be used in that sense. And that's why it is so, so interesting to, to help Africa Directo for um, development aid. As you know, we've been doing development aid for a very long time. And then the reversal of impact is just is new. This consists of sacrificing, so investing, but sacrificing part of the profitability in order to provide a service to those who are in the least uh, favored um, strata, uh, strata of society. Here we have an example, which is Sikitska Healthcare. It is a company that has ambulances in Africa. Here you have a picture of what we have done in Africa with schools. And this was in India. I was there and I. we are helping them. And 
in Bombay, for instance, Bombay, for instance, uh, for young entrepreneurs who had nine ambulances um, and a corrupt system where you actually died in the ambulance has now grown into a company that has 8,500 employees, 6.3 million beneficiaries, and 2,200 ambulances. So this is the sort of thing that we want to do. This is what we want to do. And Obviously, we haven't defined what we will keep on doing. Whenever we decided, we will publish it, and anyone can invest here as they wish to do, uh, as they wish to. So, in order to begin with this initiative, we had decided to go hand in hand with different organizations, and one of them has been um, a pleasant surprise because we got help from the Yunus Foundation, uh, represented by Mohammed Yunus. You know that Yunus was the founder of the microcredit system that has now been developed worldwide. It has its good and bad things, but it has had an enormous impact in many different countries, especially in Bangladesh. And some of the product projects that we're going to initiate will be with his organization. And in order to end, and I'm I really um, I'm going to finish with this, will be a video uh, from Mohammed Yunus who, as you know, was awarded with the Peace Nobel Prize not long ago. Video, please. Hello, everybody. I'm Mohammed Yunus. Uh, I'm talking to you from Dhaka, Bangladesh. But I'm very happy that uh, I could get a few minutes with you. Uh, to talk about uh, what we have been doing, what we feel very important about. Uh, we have been talking about uh, our work, the social business, with uh, Maria and Fran Francisco, and uh, they liked this idea. And that's the beginning of our uh, interaction and our friendship. And uh, we uh, made it uh, possible to uh, help them create uh, Open Value Social Fund. Uh, to devote some amount of money to go into uh, problem solving of people in a business way. This kind of business we call uh, social business. Thank you, Mr. Yunus. He's not here, he can't hear me, but that was the conclusion of this presentation. One hour, 20 minutes, I think this is a record, but I think it was worth it. And now we're open to getting any of the questions that you wish to ask. So I will now give the floor to Santi and Gemma so that they can come up to the stage and ask us your questions. Thank you. Hola. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. And once again, thank you for coming here. Before we begin asking questions, I, I, we would like to make sure that that you open the folders that we gave you, and so some of the things that we prepared for you for today's session, beside the files um, that explain the different funds, because you know that Paco and the team talk about international portfolio, Iberian portfolio, big companies, and in the end, the mix of all those portfolios are the funds that you know, Coba Selección, etc. So those files are there for you to peruse in the, in the folder. And if you haven't seen it, we have also prepared 25 shares that represent the companies that are part of the portfolios where you have invested. And I would like to, to read some of the information contained in those shares. And it's something that Laura Templeton said. She was um, the great nephew of John Templeton, an investor, a very famous investor in the world of investment. He's, she said that when she was seven years old, she told uh, her uh, friends that she was the owner of, of Disney, um, Gap, Walmart, and no one believed her because uh, because her friends had posters with Disney characters all over their walls in their rooms. So what we want to say at Cobas is that we want you to feel that you are the owners of businesses and companies because that is how we, the team, manage our business day to day. And from the team of investment relations, that's how we want to establish a communication with you. So with no further ado, Santi, if you want to start shooting. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank Thank you all for coming. 
I just wanted to say that we have gotten many, many, many questions from the audience and some from social networks as well. We will try to answer as many as we can. And if, if not, if we couldn't do it, then we will do it from our website. So if you want, we can start with the first question. How will you face the next public debt crisis? I'll start with the next uh, public debt crisis. Since we are owners of assets, um, that's the, way, the best way to face the situation. We have already said it a number of times, being the owner of an asset that is generating something that is interesting for society is the best way to face any crisis and to just uh, go through life, not just crisis. And during life, there will be crises, there will be booms as well. So the tr to tell the truth, I'd say that people forget that in the last 50 years, we have never had a negative growth situation in PPP. We've never had a negative growth. There have been cases when global growth was 1%, that was under 2, but it was never negative. So whatever crisis comes along, when it comes, uh, our general uh, PIB, uh, our GDP will grow, we will sell less products or our sales will grow less, but we will survive. Now, talking about Aritza. I'm sorry, I just would like to keep on answering. We are Europe-centric and US-centric as always. Obviously, in Europe and in the US, in the US as well, in Europe, there is much debt, but and maybe in China as well, but that could be debated. But basically, the rest of the world does not have debt. So let's not forget that, because we always think about the immediacy, the immediate situation. So do you think that the commercial war uh, between China and the U.S. will uh, will last longer? Will that create turbulence? Does someone dare answer that question? Andres. Andres? Yes, I, I will. I have no idea. But that's not very important either, is it? Because in the end, it's just... Uh, it's like we explained in physics: when something goes up, something goes down, and they're just they're just too too they're linked. So there will always be investment opportunities, and it doesn't really impact us, does it? The commercial war. The world is growing at 3.54 percent a year, and if there is a commercial war, then the world will grow at two three percent. So we'll have to live with it. It's worse than growing at 3, 4 percent. Obviously, it's worse for everyone. It will create death and diseases, but, but everything that is growing less is negative. But as investors, we will be able to keep on, on living with a 2, 3 percent growth. Now, now that we're talking about Aritza, People ask us, what's the trigger for the company to reach the target value that we've established? What should happen for them to get to that target value? OK, let's look at Peter Smith. Peter, did you get the question? Yeah, what's going to make it reach our value? A catalyst of trigger. A catalyst. <laughs> well, if I had a magic globe, I would uh, be able to answer that quickly. But uh, the main trigger is going to be the recovery of the margin. Um, when we start seeing the headwinds switch into tailwinds. Um, and I think that will take place in the next uh, couple of years. I can't tell you the day it's going to happen. Um, I wish I could. Uh, but that will be the main catalyst, is as soon as the margin starts to recover. I mean, this is a company that had 15% EBITDA margins for 10 years, and they've, they're at 10% now. Um, but this is a company that has strong barriers to entry, is a very good management team in place now. and I have very high conviction that they're going to go back to their long-term margin potential. Uh, whether it takes one year or 18 months, I couldn't say. But that will clearly be the, the, the main trigger. Uh, and then, of course, selling Picard. Um, it's a non-core asset, and it'll help reduce the debt. And it'll take the minds of uh, all the hedge funds that are short off of a potential capital increase. Uh, and that will be the shorter-term one. But I think that will happen in the next uh, six months. I, I'm just going to 
There are lots, and, there are lots and lots of questions for Aritza, but I think that one summarizes our concerns, the concerns of most investors. They say that during the first conference, we said that Aritza was PR 9, 9.7 for 2018. In the PLOS Bar conference, a PLOS value conference in Navarre, we said that it was PR 13.4. And it's true that we have seen that the margins have been reduced in the U.S. due to the increase in wages and salaries. And the question is, do you think that this year or for 2019 we will be able to go back to the initial margins? I'll answer that question. Yes, when the company um, thought about this uh, fiscal year that will end in July of having a 440 million EBITDA, and that gave us a benefit of 200, 200 and something million, then what happens is that when the company says that it's only going to make 330, that's 100 million less, and then t this year in 2018, obviously, if we know our math, instead of uh, making 200 and something, they will only be making 140 in benefit or 150, so obviously that's that's what it is. So it used to be P per 10, and now it's per 13 at the same level um, of share value. We've already said that we are in the worst um, moment for the company, but what should happen is for it to recover. But even if we are in the worst case scenario where there is no recovery, we would be talking about a per 10, 12 um, at the worst moment for the company. So as soon as they recover, we will see that change in the figures. So 250 million currently. Um, it's a, that's a reasonable hypothesis. When we to take a look at their competitors, that's also the range they're moving in. So as Peter said, that should recover in, in a 12-month, 18-month, 24-month uh, period. We don't know the real timing. Now, the company in the short term should maybe, as Peter said, uh, sell Picard, which is non-core, and it is, in, it, it is for sale currently. And that could happen before summer. They said they would do it before summer. We will see what happens if they find a buyer because it seems that some some companies might be interesting. So that could be a catalyzer that just getting rid of the risk that those assets could 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 be, the financial problem that that, that could represent. Okay, so an investor is asking here if currently in this uh, moment of innovation and technological disruption, are there still sectors that could become good sectors in 15 years' time? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, you could answer any of you, but oil, for instance, we are going to have to move it with our ships and bread, we will be eating more or less, but bread will always be there. And fertilizers, I mean, we will always need that. That is, Those are things that we consider. But if you, you think about those which are more or less present in our portfolio, the disruption, the technological disruption risk is very low, and that is not random. We have been looking for that. We are looking for things that we know in a few years will have the same profile that they have currently and with the same competitive dynamics so that we can sleep at night, to say it in, in other words. I don't know if you have other things to add to what I just said. What have you seen in Israel chemicals to reduce your initial exposure? And what's the competitive advantage of Israel chemicals? Andres is going to answer that question. Actually, we haven't really reduced our position because we like it less, but rather because we have found another company that is actually quite good. Can we mention the name? Yes, it's called OCI. It's a nitrogen fertilizer company. Uh, Peter mentioned it, did, and it's about uh, allocating weights adequately. But the advantage of Israel chemicals is still very clear. They have very uh, potassium-rich um, uh, sites. And uh, the Dead Sea, potassium is very difficult to produce and it's very expensive. And uh, they just have a shovel, they just grab it and allow it to dry. And that's a great advantage. And it's not just a that that they do. That's only half of the bur the business. They have a high added value business and the market is not really concerned right now. They just think that they have potassium and they leave it at that. But it's a company that goes way beyond that. It has more value, that company, than the market attributes to it in many senses. And we went to another company because it's actually quite good too, not because Israel Chemicals is bad. What do you think about the distribution sec uh, sector? 
the traditional one. Do you think uh, that uh, it's going to be that the sector is going to be penalized or punished? Well, it's a complex situation. There are some sectors that we are not uh, getting into. Actually, uh, large warehouses and uh, uh, big malls. Uh, department stores, well, we think that they're going to have competitive problems. And in the past, we were present there, but we are no longer going for it. And in some sectors, we see that the competitive advantage is sustainable for the long term. And we could even say that even Amazon has tired of, uh, for instance, uh, Dixon's and electronic devices. It's been proven that's essential to compete with uh, with a physical store. And Amazon cannot really compete in that sense. And these are aspects that we're taking into account because some people asked us about uh, the questions uh, about the mistakes that we've made. And in retail, in the distribution sector, we have made a lot of mistakes. So we are very wary of that sector, the retail sector. Why did you buy Vocento when their debt was increasing, when they had decreasing profit, negative profit? At a moment when their debt was increasing and their profit was decreasing and negative. Is there, a, is there still appraisal or evaluation? Uh, well, the answer is not right because they're decreasing their, uh, the question is not right because they're decreasing their debt. Ivan is going to answer that question. As Paco said, Vocento hasn't decreased, uh, increased its debt, it has decreased it, in spite of having bought assets. And uh, Madrid Fusion actually took place here in this very venue, and um, it's part of their uh, network. And 70% of our uh, valuation depends on uh, regional newspapers for this company. And this doesn't have anything to do with advertising in national press. It's dropped by 12 or 13 percent. Advertising in regional press has dropped by 1 or 2 percent. Um, Vocento's advertising is growing at 1 or 2 percent. So the story remains the same. By the end of uh, 2016, they had 60 million in debt. Now they have 55. So they are reducing their debt. So I don't understand what the question is about. Uh, they're not really increasing their debt. Can I ask another one? Yes, go ahead. In the automotive, uh, automotive sector, what do you think about uh, spare part uh, manufacturers? Uh, what do you think about the commoditization uh, that people think there is in this sector? Vicente is going to answer that question. Vicente, go ahead. I think uh, it's a good question, but it's very general. And we should come up with a very specific question, case by case. We should talk about component, spare part by spare part, company by company, to understand how the electrical revolution could affect them or how they are positioned in order to make the best of uh, positive trends or how they could face um, threats that could be lurking around the corner. So I cannot give you a general answer. I think that this needs a uh, case-by-case -case analysis to analyze the potential upside and uh, the margin of safety. But we should do it case-by-case -case at any rate. Another investi investor is asking how would TK Thesis uh, uh, change if they decided to invest free cash flow in uh, new uh, ships instead of uh, feeding back this uh, free cash flow to the headquarters? Well, the impact wouldn't be too relevant. Personally, I don't really know the yield that, that those companies have, have. And actually, the money that they pay out is not so relevant for us. I mean, I mean, it's not really relevant. Some Asian companies, um, they're very um, stiff with this type of things, and we try to get them to pay more dividends because uh, they have more cash than they should. But actually, this is normally neutral. If they reinvest in new projects, they will get a 10 12% return on capital, and that's a return that could be uh, assumed under good conditions. So we would rather have them pay dividends immediately. Possibly we would 
Indeed, that's what the market expects and that's what we would like. But if they don't do it and they only pay half of what was expected and half of what they have is invested in new assets, well, we consider that that new investment will yield new profitabilities. Therefore, instead of having 200 or 250 million in profit or uh, profits for shareholders, perhaps uh, ultimately in the long in the long term that will uh, yield 300 million. So it's a wise decision, but it's relatively neutral. But if we have to voice our preference, it would be nicer for them to pay out the dividend. And that's something that we'll communicate to the company, if possible, of course. There's many questions about uh, the opinion that we have about other raw materials, such as copper, uranium, Cameco. What's our opinion about those raw materials? Well, our friend Ivan Martin de Magallanes, he has invested in uh, Cameco. And uh, we have analyzed that company. So did, would you like to make a comment about Cameco and Juanca? Maybe you want to talk about copper later on, because you have visited some copper mines lately, haven't you? Well, Cameco and uranium is something that uh, we analyzed at some point. And we decide to not wage on the price of commodities. If we need the price to do something so that the company behaves in one way or another, that's not the best that we can do. So about Cameco in particular and uranium specifically, I think uh, they're selling uh, long-term contracts at uh, 40 euros per pound, I think. It's 32 or 33, I think. Between 30 and 40, yes. And uh, the current price of uranium is at 20. If it picks up and it goes up to 40, then supposedly Cameco wouldn't be making more than they're making today. They would be making the same. So the situation is unclear. And we are seeing that there's new reactors, but there aren't all that many. But there is, in turn, a great demand for LNG. So if we have to make up our minds, if we have to choose, we would place our bets on LNG instead of on the nuclear market. We don't really have a robust perspective on this. And if uh, our perspective is not too robust, we just don't invest in the market. About nuclear energy and gas, apparently everybody is uh, opting for gas and everybody's more reassured having 15% of our portfolio in gas than well, for instance, in China, in the first months of the year, they have had an 18% increase. They want to go to 15% of primary gas consumption from now until 2030. So maybe we will have ex excess gas consumption, and uh, that would be beneficial for everybody involved in the gas uh, value chain. And uh, Juan Carlos is going to talk about um, copper. Well. There is a slightly growing demand for copper. There haven't been investments in uh, new copper mines in the last uh, three to four years. So indeed, the market is going to need more copper moving forward. And we considered that the price is going to be as it stands or perhaps higher. The way we see it is we're not investing in copper companies because not because we have a positive because we don't have a positive outlook on copper. We actually do. We are analyzing a couple of companies and even if copper were to fall or not grow, even in that situation we would still be making money. So that's what we are working on right now. Another investor is asking whether we consider that there will be a hyperinflation or that inflation will remain as it is, and what sectors would we recommend um, in these type, two types of scenarios. Well, we don't know what's going to happen. My opinion for what it's worth is that in spite of the sharp decrease in interest rates that we have had in the past few years, that money that has been created artificially has been created in the reserves of banks and hasn't really leaked out to the economy in general. Therefore, getting that money from the economy, which is what the uh, US Fed is doing and what the Japanese and Europe are going to do, um, in time, because uh, ultimately we do, we just replicate what they do. Well, this fact 
is not going to be excessively good for economies. And perhaps we will manage to leave behind uh, the big mess that central banks have uh, organized without suffering an inflationary crisis. This is my opinion, and for what it's worth, it's worth for discussing it over coffee and for talking about it over the radio in the morning. But that doesn't change our investment philosophy. Basically, we focus on real assets and mainly on stocks, which are what create value best with the passing of time, I have managed to really offset inflationary processes. If there's no inflation, and if we remain at 1% or 2%, because as I said earlier, the problem with uh, very low interest rates can be solved if you increase the rates uh, bit by bit, progressively. And then stocks will do way well, and economies will do well. So uh, with an inflation of 1% or 2 uh, then we'll do well. About TK again. After what happened with TK Core, how do you know that TGP will distribute uh, the dividends to the headquarters so that the objective, the target value of 18, 20 euros uh, will materialize? Well, we're not sure of that, of course. What's important is that the company is going to create 450 million in free cash flow starting next year because of what's happening with ships, and uh, specifically for 2020. The, the, devoting those 450 million to dividends or paying off debt, that's secondary. But we need uh, the ship pipeline to uh, be commissioned to do for ships to transport gas and for them to create profit. And then we'll see how to split that profit. Having roughly 25% in the first four positions on a consecrated, concentrated portfolio, does it make sense to have a large amount of companies uh, with a 1% or even less than 5%? Well, ultimately, you need to have a diversified portfolio. And there's uh, many stocks that we actually like. And we cannot hold 6% because there are smaller stocks. And uh, it's not worth it to have such a high concentration on them. So basically, by definition, you need to have a tail or a set of uh, stocks where you have uh, smaller stakes. You learn about them. You are not so sure about them. They can become, in time, values that uh, a stock story that can go from 1 to 6 or 7%. I don't know. It does make, it makes sense because uh, uh, you're um, seed in the ground so that you can reap uh, profits in the future. In your portfolio, what does um, what has more possibilities for appraisal, Europe or the other part of the portfolio? The other day, stock by stock, stock I reviewed all of them. I think that mostly all of them have an 80 or 90 percent of appraisal um, uh, possibility, and only two or three uh, stocks are at uh, 60 percent uh, revaluation, and uh, everything's very well um, spread out. Uh, Asians are worth uh, twice. and Europeans will also appreciate. It's not a matter of having a pool that says uh, these are worth 500 and uh, these are worth this much. I think appreciation is quite balanced. Uh, another investor is asking about the country risk in uh, Russia because of LNG, TK, and the drive boat shipping. Indeed, uh, there is a certain risk. Issues with Russia could get even more complicated. But in reality, we should be careful with these things. And Yamal is a gas that has been contracted to sell it to the Chinese. They're shareholders in the project, and they're shareholders of the joint venture that they have with TK. TK owns 50% of the ships in Yamal because they're very expensive uh, uh, ships. They're icebreakers, and they uh, go around Asia towards the east. And, well, at least when they can, because you cannot do that all the year round. But the partner there is a, um, a shipping company in China, and uh, the partner that takes the gas. Uh, this is also Chinese, and I don't think it has um, much of an impact. And Total is also a shareholder. 
But in reality, uh, the uh, North Americans have not much of a say in something that has already been financed and paid for, and the gas is for somebody else. They cannot really do much about it. And uh, was there a second part to your question? Drive book shipping. Dry bulk shipping um, with, for instance, iron, coal, or grains. Those are the main types of uh, dry loads that are transported. That's also a very cyclical sector, like for the rest of shipping. The difference is that it is more dependent on macroeconomic policies. If the after tomorrow China were to say that they're going back to producing as much steel as they want, wonderful, they would buy a lot of uh, iron mineral and everything would work well. But if China says tomorrow that they no longer want to produce steel and they're cutting back on capacity because they're producing excess uh, steel or that they want to produce more coal, uh, therefore they will import less coal, that would change the policy and that would kind of have a very important impact on dry load shipping. And the actions of uh, the stocks of uh, listed companies in dry shipping had uh, hit the low part of the cycle before uh, the oil companies did. So. They are no longer so affordable and they highly depend on policies. And the combination of both factors made us think that uh, they're not so interesting anymore. And uh, we are just uh, waiting on the sidelines. We, are, uh, we have an eye on it, but it's not as attractive as uh, other areas. A uh, philosophical question now. Paco, they said that in your book, you mentioned that you invest all your money in uh, variable income. Nevertheless, why have we changed the variable income uh, and to invest in a fixed income or high yield? The person who is asking is uh, absolutely right. And it's true that it doesn't make much sense. But we've done this for all funds. So if at some point we want to invest in some sort of bond, for instance, for our, our fixed income fund, we have in, invested in TK bonds because we know the company very well and we thought that the bonds were uh, undervalued. So at some point in time, we wanted to have flexibility, enough flexibility in all funds in order to do that type of thing. And we will do this uh, once every five years or 10 years. It's something that has been truly exceptional. There's many questions about uh, the diversification of savings and uh, what you would recommend. And there's another question that uh, wants to know what the Equum agreement is all about. Well, there's uh, many interesting managers right now. One of the most interesting right now in Spain is Equam. This agreement is still subject to the approval of the Spanish SCC, so we cannot really say much about it, but normally they would approve it, we think. And what we're trying to do is to support other managers. Uh, we like the way they work. They have a small amount under management. And one of the cases is exemplified by Equum. We have a stake with them. And we just want to support them so that they can uh, improve the, or uh, rather extend the assets under management that they have. And when they gain enough uh, size to fly on their own, then we'll disappear from the map. We'll, we'll have perhaps a minor uh, stake. But uh, what we wanted to do is to, of course, uh, help them and create competitors, which is something that we historically like to do. Obviously, and quite honestly, I think they have the best portfolio in the market, not considering uh, Cobas' uh, portfolio. This is why we're investing in them, because we believe in what they do. 
There are rumors that Warren Buffett is a screening General Electric. Do you think that's a value company? What do you think about uh, General Electric? And in line with this uh, question, there's another investor who is asking why we don't have uh, relevant positions in electrical companies in Spain, even though the multiples are very interesting. I don't know if General Electric is a value company, but it's getting close to it bit by bit. We have uh, followed it from a distance, but I don't have a sound opinion about it. Last time I checked, they were at uh, PR15. They have a very complex conglomerate. They have an engine business and many others, and I don't know. It's very difficult to add much value at PR15. I don't know if anyone's very well acquainted with uh, General Electric. Lately, have you taken a look at it? And um, what was the other question? Why aren't you invested in uh, power companies in Spain? We do have some power companies in Spain. Ivan, would you like to answer? We ha don't have a very big position, but maybe in this quarter we have uh, um, gained positions for uh, Endesa or Gas or EDP. In general, we don't have uh, much exposure in utility companies. And companies that we actually like are in the regulated business, and they need diversified. They need to be diversified in terms of type of business and geographical area, so that we don't just depend on one type of business in case uh, the regulators consider reducing their um, remuneration. But we have analyzed some companies, and um, they haven't been included in our portfolio because of of uh, the uh, upside requirements that they have to meet to enter the portfolio. But in general, we do like them. Even though, obviously, the utility sector in Spain has uh, many pending subjects, many things that they need to tackle specifically because uh, for renewable energy and for uh, power distribution and for uh, power transmission, uh, electricity and gas, that depends on uh, the bonds, the Spanish bonds. And uh, with uh, low interest rates, it's quite likely that the remuneration will decrease, as has been stated by the minister. So the companies that we have in our portfolio are quite diversified in terms of risk. And the ones that could be knocking on the door, they need to compete with the remainder of the portfolio. But we do have about 3% or 4% of our fund invested in utilities. Actually, there was a drop in uh, in stock prices uh, this uh, quarter, and uh, we actually took took the chance to buy, but it isn't public yet. If Korea Telecom is uh, so affordable, uh, why isn't it in uh, Coba selection? KT Korea Telecom. <laughs> It's not public, but it is in Cobas International and Cobas Selection. We have invested in that this quarter. Well, now it's public, but technically it will become public on May 1st. Next year we will have our conference in May so that we don't have this type of issue here. It's already been decided. It's set on stone. We have many questions from many investors asking about our dear BMW. It's a general comment about BMW. Juan, you haven't taken the floor. Why don't you talk about uh, vehicles and BMW in general? Juan Huerta. Can you hear me? Well, I think we all know uh, BMW. We have known it for quite a long time. It's um, quite dear to us still. It's at PR8, seven or eight. It has 20 billion euros in net cash, and it's a very good business. It's still a very good brand, very well considered, and they're up to date in terms of uh, 
driverless vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and all the different disruptions that are in uh, the market. And the only problem is, or well, the only issue is that we have found other companies, such as Hyundai, Porsche, which is Volkswagen, and Renault in the automotive business, and they're all very interesting. They have uh, very affordable multiples right now, and we consider that the market concern is uh, excessively high right now. So BMW is still in our portfolio, but perhaps uh, we have reduced uh, the weight in relative terms because there's other companies that are even more affordable than um, BMW, more value. We have several questions about the retail question, about the retail sector. They want to know our opinion and about the offline and online world, for instance, Inditex versus Amazon. We are going to give the floor to Carmen so she can give us a speech about the retail sector and Amazon. Well, this is a very broad question and difficult to answer it because of the disruption that we are witnessing, as Paco mentioned. As for Amazon. Going back to what Paco said, we're trying to enter the fields in which uh, Amazon's threat is not so relevant or when it's a thing of the past, like for Dixon. Dixon's is a company that's a very important position for us in our fund. And what happened in the UK is that it's been demonstrated that in uh, similar prices, Dixon's matched uh, the prices offered by Amazon's. And what has been proven is that consumers like to go to the store so that they can have a repair service, a post-sale services, advisories, and uh, this has increased uh, the like for like. We're talking about companies such as DFS in the uh, couch sector. They are also exposed to Amazon risk and many others too. In the case of Inditex, well, I don't know if the question is about whether we have it in our portfolio or not because it's a very general question. But actually, not too long ago, I attended a company presentation and they're doing very well in the online business. Uh, this model that they have, flexible management, uh, and actually outfits get to store very quickly. This has been very beneficial for the offline world. And uh, they started closing down uh, small stores a while ago, and they now work with flagship stores so that customers can go there and pick up their online orders. And this is something that uh, customers highly value, the possibility of returning their clothes in the store and picking up their orders in the store. That's an advantage that Amazon has uh, um, this advantage that Amazon has vis-a-vis -vis other competitors such as Inditex. So basically, that's our position. Since you're talking about the online world, we have uh, many managers that ask us about Facebook. Do we think that this is going to be consolidated in the future? What do you think? What's going to happen with this type of companies? If no one wants to take the floor, I will go for it. No one wants to talk about Facebook here. I don't want to talk about it either, to be honest. Well, it's just like Inditex. I went to Arteixo for the first time ever last year in the summer, and I was very privileged because the online director, he showed me everything that they're doing online, how they structured their operations, and it's frankly impressive, but they're listed at 20, they're uh, PR 20, and that's a problem for us, a serious problem for us, and for me personally too. Maybe it's for some people in the team, this is not so much of a problem, but for me, it's a very serious problem. And the same applies to Facebook. It's a company that's reasonably new in a business that's reasonably new too. Uh, we need to give it some time. We need to give the business some time so that it can become stable and see what the evolution is all about. Maybe everything, maybe everything will be peachy or maybe people will uh, unregister from Facebook or delete their Facebook with one click. We don't know what will happen. Advertisers are actually quite happy with Facebook, with the services rendered, and with the way they work. We don't know whether that's going to be the situation in 10, 10 years' time, so, that we don't, so we don't want to assume that risk. OK, now Russia. It's another topping on the table. They're asking us, what do we think about the excessive concentration with Yamal in the case of TK Offshore? We've already talked about that. We've already answered that question. Do we see any latent risk due to that? No, because Yamal is a joint venture between Novatec, which is a Russian company, Total, and 
and I don't know what the Chinese company's name is. It's a Chinese corporation, a company, an electric, um, an electric company, and they have hired these people who take the gas from Yamal in Siberia, from the north of Siberia to China. That's it. I don't know what can the Americans do. Maybe the Sixth Fleet could be there and just blockade them so that the ships cannot go through. But I don't know what else could happen. It's all been financed. The gas project as well as the vessels have already been financed and with Chinese fin financing. So there isn't much of a problem, really. And actually, Novatec is already in its second phase because Yamal is a 15 million tons LNG uh, project and the next project called Arctic 2 has already been initiated because they have a new project with an, a further 15 million tons and this project this this pro uh, project uh, by Jamal has been done by Denib, a French company it seems that the French really don't care about sanctions and so on so Technip has done it. And in that project, Yamal 2, or Arctic 2, which is led by Novatec, they are fighting just to get in. And Saudi Arabia is now, the government of Saudi Arabia is now investing in Yamal 2. They're just giving capital. So the risk is non-existent, really. Oh, obviously, there is always risk in life, but Okay, I have two questions, although I've, you, I already know the answer you're going to be giving, but what's your vision for the Spanish risk premium for 2018, and do we foresee a fall in Wall Street in June this year? Do we foresee a drop in Wall Street? Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> That's the easy one. And, the, and what's our vision about the Spanish risk premium? Well, Spain as a country, the private part of Spain is, is working as better than ever. Never Spain has behaved as well as it has in the last two, three years. And fortunately, and let's start, knock on wood, but the next three, five years, we should have a healthy mm, growth without private debt and with balanced um, balance account. And then there's the state, the Spanish state. We have 98 uh, GDP debt that we cannot uh, lower. We can't lower from, from that deficit. So we have a problem. That's a problem that Spain has. So it's difficult to take that public debt down. I don't know if in 2018, but there is a risk for the situation to, to, to remain flat because either Spain grows too much and the public debt does not increase, so the debt with regards to GDP could fall, or else we could have a public debt situation that could be worrisome at some point. Considering the, the situation in Catalonia and the fact that we like family-run businesses, how do we see Reit Jofre? Reit Jofre. I don't know that company. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know it. I don't know if you're familiar with that company. It's, it's a very small Cat Catalan company, but it's true that I haven't looked into it for a very long time. But what I do know is that they sell a lot outside of Spain, so it shouldn't be a strong impact, I'm guessing. No, we don't know it enough. I'm sorry, we, we can't give you an expert answer. It's a very small company. It is a bit out of our field of focus. Okay, so joining this question to the fact that it is a very small company, they ask us that um, just like other value managers, have we thought about launching a micro caps fund or why did we not think about launching it? Well, we might do something this year in that sense and we will um, inform about it. It w might not be one of our funds, but something in that sense. It is the next initiative that we will set up. We can't give you any more details regarding this, not now. So now that we're talking about England, an investor is asking, in the end, Brexit negotiations, if they do not end with a friendly exit and the market does not recognize its British values uh, with potential, wouldn't we be losing sight of other better opportunities? UK citizen, might you have something to say? Do I have a, a view on Brexit? Well, uh, I believe it, we shouldn't be doing it. I mean, that's, that's the main view. Um, but I think it, it comes back to something you said earlier, Paco, that it, it's, it's a great opportunity. 
this is a short-term factor that will, that's having an impact on the market. And as a result, we're seeing a lot of interesting ideas. Um, I've been looking at uh, some of the pub companies, which are trading extremely uh, low valuations. But uh, elsewhere in the market, uh, it's the same thing, it's the same factor. People are worried about what's going to happen. But that, that will, it, will, it, will, it will be resolved and we'll move forward. Uh, and normality will resume and, uh, and those valuations will then uh, rise. So for me, it's a great opportunity. And that's really the only way we can look at it rather than trying to second guess the politics or, or trying to second guess the result. So in the end is what we have said during all the examples we have given, if Brexit ends up badly and there is some sort of a fight, then we will not make as much money as we would expect from those companies, but we will still be making money because we're buying at such low prices that it will be very difficult to not make money with uh, examples as Dixon's, for instance. And if the, in the end the exit is a friendly one, which is the most probable case scenario, then British companies will have an important ap um, appreciation and we will have a good result. We are being asked if we see any value in Ryanair and if we would consider it an investment opportunity as a company leader in their sector, in the airline sector. Would someone like to give an answer? Well, we were with them last year, and now they want to come to our offices, and I think we said no. But last year, we did meet with them, and we purchased some shares from EasyJet as well, and the competitive advantages that Ryanair has are there. I mean, they're there, but we think that with time, they could be replicated. They're not really advantages that that will um, only be theirs. Some might, but but what they offer is just low prices, uh, but going to airports that are, that are very far away from the city. So this that's an offer that's there. It has its its target, and it could be replicated. I I don't know. I don't know. Um, there are other more interesting alternatives that are clearer for us in the market, although Ryanair is a good company, obviously. What importance do we give to catalysts that materialize the hidden value of a company when investing? And they refer to Asian companies with lots of cash that we have in our portfolio. Okay, so important weight in our portfolio. In some cases, we think that we're really thinking of catalysts, those elements that could get our valuations go up. We give them some importance, for instance, the Arista case, which is one that has been very much commented on. Uh, besides the delay in the plan, we think that this is something that could happen quite quickly, and that is why it has such an important weight in our portfolio when compared to other companies that are worth twice as much, maybe. And the same with TK. We think that this could reasonably could happen reasonably, reasonably um, quickly, and they do have a certain weight. So sometimes we think that a catalyst is to be found here, but and then we find it somewhere else. But you never know. So as for Asian companies, well, obviously, if there were catalysts in the short term, we wouldn't have 15 percent. We would have 50 percent in Asian companies. And as Min Kun has just explained, they're all companies that are worth 100. They have 80 percent in their cash flow, and they make 10 every year on a yearly basis. So it is absurd. It's completely absurd, the situation that they have in most of, of those companies. So what happens there? Well, the families just decide that 80, those 80 that they have in their cash are going to be left there just in case, and they will not be paying, paying out those dividends. So you have a problem of cost of opportunity. So we have some investments, not very high, but if at some point there is a surprise, we will benefit from it. So we have considered it. We did consider it when thinking of giving more or less weight to each of those values. And now, uh, linking it to the next question, an investor says, uh, asks if, if the final decision when deciding to invest in a company is only based on the strict analysis that you do, or if there is some personal intuition in, involved in the mix. So how much intuition, how much um, analysis is there? When assessing a company, there is no intuition. There are just figures and a reality, a certain reality. But if you decide to give it a weight of three, six, two, then maybe intuition could play a part there when you decide how quickly things could happen. So 
We were talking about that the other day and we were going through the main values and those are the main values because or the, the main um, elements because we think that the price and the value will will uh, unite the price going to the value and not the other way around, hopefully. So there is some intuition, obviously, when we give them more or less importance, not understanding the business, understanding and analyzing the business is just so it's a job, not an intuition. Although intuition sometimes is a consequence of a long trajectory, a long experience. We've said that um, many times. Another investor asks if we could uh, reduce the minimum investment of Cobas Concentrados. Could we reduce it? No, it's a more risky fund, a more volatile fund, a more complicated one, and that is why we have a higher minimum investment. Um, because you could ha you can have a less than 100,000. Yes, that's what the law establishes. In the past, it was 50,000, and now they raised it to 100,000. Oh, no, you can't then. There are a couple of questions about Telefónica. And I have to ask this question to you, Carmen. What is Telefónica's investment strategy uh, despite their debt level? Carmen. The investment in Telefónica is summarized quite easily. Two months ago, they were at minimums. And the feeling of the company is quite negative, and there is much worry with regards to mass mobile and the situation with mass mobile. And if you dig deep, you will see that last year the market was more competitive at the end of the year. But at the beginning of this year, all the companies in the sector, including mass mobile, have, inclu have increased their prices. And if you ask mass mobile, they do not wish to be disruptive. They're doing it very well. They're getting their share of the market. But they're in a niche, which is the low end of the market, where Telefonica doesn't even play. Telefonica is at a higher level with uh, greater value clients. And then on the other hand, we have the worry about debt. It's true that the level of debt is quite high, 56 billion, including hybrids. And if you look at it, comparing it to the EBITDA, which is a more orthodox way to do things, it is uh, five times. And for a company that generates as much cash as Telefonica, it's not that much. But it is true that it is the main worry that managers have. It is their main objective to reduce the debt. And they have on top of the table a series of possibilities. Two weeks ago, they, they already told the um, Argentinian authorities that they were going to do things in the stock. And it seems that they will IPO in UK as well with their uh, subsidiary in the UK and something else that will help reduce their debt levels is the CAPEX. In Spain, we have one of the best fiber coverages in Europe. We are in a situation that can be compared to Nordic countries. So most of the investment has already been done and now the CAPEX oversell should go uh, down and allow for more cash generation in the company. And due to the low levels of their shares, it's one of the main positions of the fund. And another investor asks about Quabit and what's their future behavior, or what we expect to be their future ex uh, behavior to go up, obviously. Otherwise, I mean, uh, or else we will wait for them to go lower. In Quabi, I think that, first of all, we should explain what happened in the real estate sector in the last 12 years. They completely changed the situation, what happened in 2006, 2007, where 800,000 um, housing projects were being built, just like in France, and uh, just what was built in France and the UK and Germany together. And now we have gone down to 50,000 um, housing, housing facilities as an average. So we believe that there is a deficit in certain areas, nonetheless. That's with regards to the sector. And there has also been a, a financial discipline that was imposed from without. And not anyone can be a promoter. Not everyone can purchase a flat. And now getting into Cohabit, what we like about them is that their valuation is lower than the one that we, ex we expect the company to get up to. They have hidden assets. We could call them hidden, that have taxes that could be applied, and many analysts don't consider those assets. Uh, something else that we like is the fact that 
there is an investor who owns 24-25% of the company, and he knows the sector quite well. It is a person who has been in the sector for a very long time. You ask them about any location, and they will tell you how they purchase it, who's their neighbor uh, on the one hand and the other. So it's a person who really knows the sector. And as Paco said, our, our um, target value is higher than what they currently have. And that's it. So obviously, there are risks. And the main risk in real estate sector is for it to go up quickly with regards to interest rates. But that should happen progressively, since it wouldn't just uh, affect Guabit or the real estate sector in Spain, but the whole economy in Spain. So bearing that in mind, with the position that we currently have in Guabit, we feel comfortable due to the company, the sector, the manager. The manager. So a summary, I'd say that we believe that we will have an upside. Another question with regards to our best in their period. An investor is asking what part of the mistakes made that at that time were mistakes in companies that had a high debt level. Well, yes, that sometimes happens, but sometimes debt is there, but you cannot see it because there is a capacity for generating benefits that suddenly drops and disappears. So maybe it's not a problem um, at a certain point and then debt becomes a problem later on. So that's a problem. You can't really analyze the business and the business is worse than you thought it was. And that has happened to us in many companies, in many of the companies that, uh, that were had to present a chapter 11. That's what happened. I remember that there was a, an English pub company that were second level pubs, um, a, a company that uh, a, a card, um, a greetings card company that didn't have much debt. But uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes the um, business goes through a rough patch, and even if you don't have a debt, you have 20 million, 20 million pounds, and you can pay it. So sometimes. I'd say that the problem is with the business model. If the business model fails you, then you can't face the debt. But if your business model is strong enough, then you can face the debt. And many of the mistakes that were made were made in retail. In, in, in retail. So we had lots of problems there. And they're asking us about the evolution of currency exchange, uh, euro to pound and, and to dollars and Swiss francs. What's the volatility of this currency? Um, there, obviously, this has to do with Arista. Uh, dollar is 1.2324. So at this level, the risk is lower than it was a year ago when we were talking about 1.05. And the risk was very high at that time. And unfortunately, up till 1.11, we couldn't cover. And and at 111, we saw lots of risk. But now 123, 124, there isn't much risk. And we're covered because it's reasonably cheap and because we have lots of exposure outside of the euro. But with uh, the idea in mind of uh, reducing that coverage, um, I don't know when. And and not do it because we are getting to levels where this is the reasonable price for euro 125 to 130. So we only work with currencies when they're an, at an extreme situation. In moments when the currency is very, very close to its normal range, then going up or down doesn't really have an impact on us. Because in the end, there is always some sort of natural coverage in companies because these are global companies and it doesn't really matter what the strength of the currency is. Uh, very clear case is Aritza. Aritza is, um, is listed with, Frank, with Swiss francs, but they don't work in Switzerland. So if the uh, Swiss franc goes down 10%, then the share would go up 10% and it would balance itself. For instance, um, with Schindler, that was a clear case. When we were shareholders, they didn't have any activities in Switzerland. So when the franc went up, then their shares would go down the same day. What's important is where you sell your product. Uh, at what currency you sell it. 
Now, digging in depth uh, in the shipping sector, there is an investor who proposes to look into Not Offshore, a company that's called Not uh, with a K. It is a company that operates in a very um, specialized segment in oil shipping, and apparently they have a very young um, vessel when compared to their competitors. Um, not the shuttle. Yes, we looked into it because it competes with, against TK, the mother company. Well, TK LNG um, depends from the mother company, and the mother company has another company that is called TK Offshore. And in TK Offshore, that has two sides of its business. There is one that's good that does the same thing that Knudsen not. And we looked into it because they have 45% of the global market each, and it is a very good market. It's a very good company, and we talked to them just to to see what they do because we wanted to understand the value chain of each company um, top to bottom so that we could understand the business we talked to them and they're in our uh, database of ideas whenever their their valuation goes down because it's a very good company and they're also asking us about our investment um, strategy with Volore Juan do you want to talk about Volore well the strategy with Volore is it's quite simple, well, depending on how you look into it, because Valore has two sides to it. The first one is uh, their shares in Vivendi, and the other one is African ports and harbors. And there is another one that's also good for the valuation, which is the fact that of all the shares they have, 56% 56% is a lie. Um, so these are shares that they have of them uh, about themselves. So when you simplify the whole circular system that they have with shares and participations, you see that the company is cheaper than it actually is. And with regards to African harbors and ports, Africa suffered a lot due to commodities. And what they mainly export in Africa are commodities. And they mainly export through their harbors, their ports and harbors. So this suffered in volumes and prices. And during the last three quarters, this is changing. They're recovering from this. And, and thanks to that, I think that, well, I'm not really sure, but um, we are seeing that there is an appreciation, and we are now benefiting from that effect. Going back to Aritza, an investor asks us how this could um, impact a new fee, a new tax, um, a new tax, a new levy in American cereals. A uh, new custom tax with American uh, cereals. The big issue was butter, and, and uh, Sorry, I the, the, the question is, if there is a tariff on cereals from the Chinese, from the, in the U.S. to Chinese, well, the, for the Chinese to cereals, to, well, where, where is the tariff? The, the, the American cereals uh, selling into the into China? Oh, no, oh, no. Okay. Yeah. U.S. cereals. I mean, that would have zero impact on Aritza. Uh, Aritza sources all their uh, grains from the U.S. I mean, all their Euro American stuff, uh, bread that they make, they source from the U.S. and they sell in the U.S. So a Chinese tariff is completely irre irrelevant. Um, and they also hedge their prices um, and linked to their contracts. And so even the volatility of the underlying grains is um, not impacting them. Um, well, not the case for butter, um, which they can't hedge, uh, and that has affected them uh, primarily in Europe in the last year. But uh, outside of that, uh, grains is not relevant for for it, so. Another investor asks us about what about our thoughts regarding high dividend companies and if we could explain the changes that have been introduced in Cobas Iberia, which you have already explained. No, no, what we think about companies with high dividends. And then the second question is changes introduced in Cobas Iberia, which you have already explained a few minutes ago. Well, we've already said it. What's important is how the company generates benefits. If they paid all via dividend, then 
good. The market will reflect that. Mature companies, uh, mature infrastructures usually pay out larger dividends, and the market shows shows that. And if dividends are not paid, then that also works. We're quite neutral with regards to dividend payout. What's important is generating benefits and how much we're paying for that flow of benefit generation by the company. Some companies, some such as DHT, have to refinance their debt with tariffs that are, are at a minimum. Do you think there is a risk for dilution? Andres. Andres? I think there should be no risk of dilution because, for instance, DHT. Actually, it's a very good question because with regards to shipping, you really need to know not just how much that the company has, but also how old or new the, sh the, the fleet is. For instance, for a company that doesn't have much debt, but if their fleet is very old, then they have a problem. And DHT, for instance, is a company that has a quite a new fleet and they have to refinance it and, and refinance their debt and that's no problem because these are liquid assets that can be sold in the market and the banks know that. The same thing with international seaways. They don't have such a new fleet, but it's a bit older, but they have less debt. So the question is relevant, but you need to understand it within the context uh, considering the age of the fleet and there is no problem whatsoever in DHT. And sorry, I'm going to link that with another question. What sort of guarantees does uh, TGP have to risk to cover the risk of the counterparty in long-term agreements that they have? What are the guarantees in the end with those long-term um, contracts? It depends on the counterparty, but they have uh, stronger or weaker guarantees. In the end, a Shell, a BP, Total, their, their companies that see no incentive in breaching the contract with one of the 500 ships that they're using in the long term. It makes no sense to them to just um, end an agreement with a party that you've been working with for 25, 30 years. So it's a very limited risk. We are being asked if we have um, a position that could benefit from a consolidation in the utilities sector between electricity and gas in Europe, and if we see any potential takeover uh, bid in that sense. No, there was one, but we sold it yesterday, so we don't have it. Actually, because there were being um, uh, rumors were there about a consolidation in the electrical. Um, European sector. An investor is asking, why didn't we decide to invest in Israel Corp? And why did we invest in the mother company, Israel Chemicals? This investor says that it seems that Israel Corp is cheaper at first sight, maybe, and it is something that we will look into in the future. An investor asks, how frequently do we get it wrong when studying uh, values? How often do we make mistakes when assessing values um, or stock? So how many companies do you have to analyze for one to get into the, into the fund, into the portfolio? Well, we try to not waste time and really focus on what we study. And we dedicate little time to companies that will not be a part of our portfolio. So the pre-selection is quite quite, quite um, strong, to say it, um, in other words. So we try to to really make sure that we analyze something that we like. We have a portfolio that is worth twice as much as it was at the beginning. So in order to be part of this portfolio, you have to have special characteristics. Because being, uh, being part of this portfolio means that uh, that this position has to have a high appreciation potential. So we have to be very precise in what we do. When calculating the ROSI, do you use goodwill as well, or do you not consider it? No, we don't consider it. We try to consider the main characteristics of the business today. We don't consider the possible mistakes of acquisitions that were made in the past, like the case of Aritza, where there were some um, negative impact um, due to their goodwill because they purchased things at very, at very high prices. But the assets that they have do uh, create a 20 percent profitability in the worst case scenario so we don't we don't take it uh, against them the goodwill is I mean we consider it to see the quality of previous uh, purchases and to assess the management as well 
Okay, so now talking about the technical analysis, an investor asks it would be interesting to 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 make the right choice when um, when buying, and also if we didn't assess the entry of Aritza, we we didn't use it for this. Uh, we I like to see graphs, and I like to see a context where we where we're at, that the company is flooring and is not going to drop any further. So some of the thing, some of those things are interesting. Graphs are interesting to see in a in a visual way what the investment looks like, but not to make decisions about whether the uh, share is going, uh, the stock is going down 10% or not, and then we have to sell. It doesn't make se make any sense. And as for the Aritza timing, uh, have we calculated, uh, have you miscalculated our entry in Aritza? Yes, because the truckers in the U.S. were going to have their wages go up. So that's what we miscalculated. Yes, we we enter the market, we purchase with information that we have, and things happen. In some cases, there are positive things. Many companies last year helped to contribute to that 10%. Why? Because we purchased and things positive things happen, and their shares went up 30%, and we sold. And in other, con in other cases, we purchased then we had um, negative surprises or we purchased more. In all of these cases, we purchased more. And we are still waiting for the share to, or the stock to develop. An investor is asking about our excess trust on the new management. That's what they were talking about, miscalculating. Well, I insist the poor new management has had the problem that the cost of transport in uh, cooled trucks has skyrocketed, and that's not a problem of the new management. They don't have anything to, to do with that. Investors couldn't know about that. The rest of the uh, U.S. Uh, community of companies in the road transport business, they couldn't know about that. So it's taken them all by surprise. We need to play the cards that we receive, and we need to make the best of moves that those cards can afford us. Perhaps in a few years' time, we'll say it was very nice that this happened and that the rates had got to uh, $22. Uh, now we say it's good that Lehman went down and uh, we managed to buy uh, so many uh, stocks at uh, cheap prices. If Lehman uh, hadn't fallen, we could have never uh, bought BMW at 11 euros and multiplied by five or six. If uh, the issue with uh, trucks hadn't had happened in uh, the US, we wouldn't be buying Aritza at the price that we have bought it. So in five years' time, we will say that the profits have increased thanks to that. Take it into account the quality of business and their attractive uh, valuation. Why do we have uh, uh, positions such as Fujitech that are so low in our funds? Well, I don't know. No. Everyone's asking about uh, their own business. Why don't we add more to this one or, or more to that one? So you need to take efforts of one to put them into somebody else. So why would we reduce our position in Fujitech, which is a wonderful Japanese elevator company? Just for you to get an idea, it's uh, the, the leader in Japan, fourth in Osaka. If you travel to Singapore and Hong Kong, you will know that uh, there's many high buildings there. Well, they're leading in those companies. They have a very good position in China. They have, I don't know, 200, 300 million euros in cash. But there's many other very many other interesting aspects too. So when we sell some things, we will strengthen this position. So we buy new and interesting things. But this is the ongoing discussion, and this is the permanent um, decision that we need to make. Where do we allocate the additional money that we get every single day? Because we get money from our customers, or because we sold here or there? But there's no answer to that. That's our daily struggle, our bread and butter, and that's what ultimately causes the fund uh, to increase in value, which is the ultimate goal. They're asking us if we're considering closing the funds and at what volume. 
It's true that there was a certain confusion in January when we submitted the letter. What we meant to say was that we are closer to closing, but we're still very far away. We're closer than last year, but we're still very far away. Roughly, our idea is if uh, we get to 1 million euros in Spain, we will close it. And outside of Spain, uh, 3 or 4 billion euros. And in Spain, we're at 400. And outside of Spain, we're at uh, 2,000. Uh, if we make it, it's fine. And if we don't, then it's fine too. And if we get to that point, we'll close it too. Fortunately, uh, the large corporate fund, which is something that we didn't elaborate on much, it's always left orphan. We think that we're creating a very interesting fund. It's really be worthwhile. It's really going to be worthwhile when we close our global funds, if we ever do so. They're asking us what you think about uh, PV power, given the increase of this type of s and the increase in this type of sites. Are you considering it? Uh, not directly, Ivan. You've recently met with some uh, PV companies. PV power. Well, we're not very engaged. We're not very involved because we're not very exposed to it in any company. So, Ivan, would you like to talk about it? Well, Solar and Audas are listed companies that we haven't looked into much, but we have analyzed other companies in the sector. What happens with solar power, with some power, is that the cost of assembling or uh, creating a plant has um, decreased. When uh, solar was released 10 years ago, the cost of creating a plant was 6 million euros, approximately, per megawatt installed. And now it's at 0 0.7, 0 0.8 million euros per megawatt installed. We may end up investing in this type of, problem, of companies or not, but I don't actually see it. I don't think it's uh, affordable right now at the prices that they're listed with. But we do keep a close eye on them because of the evolution of the electric system right now. Currently, that's 4.5 gigas in uh, PV power in the system. And by 2030, it's expected that it'll increase to 30 three or 34 gigas. So we do keep a close eye on them because of that, but not because we want to invest in this type of companies. They're also asking us about whether our investment in raw materials is due to opportunity or uh, due to the fact that the remainder is uh, expensive. Well, we already mentioned it. First, because the remainder are expensive. The typical companies that we like with uh, important competitive advantages, they are expensive right now. And secondly, if everything is expensive and the alternative is to keep our money in our current account, we would rather invest in center raw materials that are a low moment of the cycle. And we consider that they can yield value in three or four times. This will never be a permanent investment, but they can be uh, three or four year investments. A more personal question, Paco. And I say this because there's many questions that are similar to this, and I would like to uh, amalgamate them into one. What part of your savings are allocated to COVAS funds, and what part of your savings do you allocate to a uh, concentrated fund? Well, it's approximately 80-20. 80 to the selection portfolio, partly Spain and partly international, mostly international, of course. And also a part of it to concentrate it. It's 20%. And I would like to say that all incentives that we have set up for our employees in the long term, well, half of those incentives, bonuses and so on, they are paid uh, by stakes in COBAS selection or COBAS funds. They are asking us our opinion about Afterinox. It's a great company, another um, key companies in Spain. They actually give a good name to Spain beyond its borders. It's a cyclical company. They are at a good moment of their cycle right now. That's why we are not holding stakes in that company right now, because they're at a reasonably good moment of the cycle. An investor is saying that just like us, 
here today. If you could only ask one question to the CEO of a company that you're interested in investing in, in what would be your one question to ask to the CEO? Well, you can all give your opinion, but my question would be what's the greatest danger that you see from now until five years' time. If they didn't know or they have no clue whatsoever, that's a bad sign. Do you have any other questions? Ivan says uh, what uh, keeps them awake at night, right? It's more or less the same. Juan Huerta. I like to ask if they had an important amount of money, would they invest that money in their own company? How do we protect ourselves from value traps in the raw materials uh, sector? In a sector in which demand is growing year on year, it's very difficult to have a value trap in a raw material. For instance, an example could be uh, ship companies. Every year, demand increases for oil by 1.5 percent, one million and a half uh, more uh, barrels. That increases year on year. And 5 percent of the fleet goes every year to scrap. So every year you need 6.57% new fleet in order to just be stable, to not have problems with um, lack of ships. But if fleets remain low, no one would have enough funding to do that constantly. So by the finish, the cycle will have to pick up sooner or later. So what we try to do is to determine the dynamics for each commodity that we're invested in and to assess the possibilities of doing new investments in the midterm in that sector. And if there's a need for a new investment, uh, as it happens in uh, the uh, field of tankers, then fleets will have to pick up because otherwise people will not invest. And that's applicable to all industries, all sectors. Currently, we're purchasing assets at a low price and we will end up uh, profiting from uh, those fleets that are not uh, included or contemplated into those prices. And that's how you avoid value traps. And by definition, it's very difficult for these to happen in very cyclical businesses because ultimately, um, Capacity is pouring out of uh, the market when they're not making money, which is what's going on. They're uh, eliminating ships from the fleet. Here we have a question about market timing. An investor is asking whether we need to make periodical uh, recommendations or accumulate liquidity for when a crisis comes around so that we can profit from that right moment so that we can enter those investments. Well, personally, what I do is whenever I have liquidity, I invest in funds the next day. I don't think about new crises for one more minute or whether we will have 10 years of wine and roses. They're asking us whether we would consider investing in new gold. They're a mining company for gold. A mining company for gold with a production that will double in the next few years. Have you analyzed new gold, Juan? Well, we looked over it briefly. We did some things, but... Um, in the raw material sector, we came across companies that interested us more than gold companies. And so we didn't drill down into new gold. And the market is not stupid. If they're going to double their size, then the company will probably take note of that. I don't know if there's discrepancies about that or not, but we don't know about it sufficiently. Even though Chile Coffee then is no longer in the portfolio, an investor is asking us uh, to talk about how we value companies with high net cash that actually do nothing 
uh, with it. Well, Cofidia, Silicon Cofidia is, is in the portfolio. And uh, for Asian companies with high cash, Daniele or Silicon Cofidia, the two Italian companies that we have in our portfolio, well, someday something will happen for these companies. I remember that 25 years ago in Spain, we had many companies with a high cash and um, there's none of them left. So possibly in the next 20 years, those companies that have cash in Europe, in Italy, in um, Asia, they will possibly not have so much cash at that point. And I don't know, we'll profit from that at any given point. But what's essential is that underlying business needs to be good business. It needs to create more cash year on year, and sooner or later we will get it. And that's the case of Chiricofide or Danieli. They're asking us how long do we deem it necessary for the fund to double its um, its value. It can take uh, one year or more. Our job is to um, in increase uh, the value of the fund, um, taking into account the net asset value. It's uh, very strange for a fund to uh, to behave in the opposite way. I don't know. I think it will do it sen sooner than later. There's many people, uh, many young people asking questions. In general, they're asking, what would be your advice uh, for a young investor, a 24-year-old investor moving forward? And specifically, there is an investor who's saying they, that they're considering using part of their savings uh, to buy a house uh, and getting a mortgage or uh, renting a home and investing the savings in uh, value. What's the best option taking into account the current increase of our rental prices and uh, the rates? There's actually many young people asking uh, questions about uh, what to do in this uh, context. Well, we will need to analyze specific situation. As Peter Lee said, buying a home is never a bad idea because you need a mortgage and that forces us to um, save. But just the other day on TV, we saw someone who uh, was saying that prices are skyrocketing and hitting um, Mm, ma historical maximums in the center of Madrid and, um, and Barcelona, but in uh, the outskirts of Madrid, prices are still 30 or 50 percent below maximum. If the alternative is to buy a flat in the city center, then perhaps uh, it's not so much of a good auction. Perhaps it m would make sense to buy some good stocks some of the stocks that we have mentioned, and that would perhaps make sense. But if you're going to buy a house at 1,500 euros square, per square meter in the outskirts of Madrid, that could be a good option, an alternative to a fund. I don't know. Each personal case uh, needs to be individualized. And I talk about that in the book. If you don't have uh, too many family responsibilities, uh, maybe I would always invest in stocks if you're young. Actually, this year for my children, we have done investments, uh, harnessing the fact that uh, the minimum is 100 euros, and uh, each of them have their own uh, position in the fund. So the sooner it start, the better. We also talked about the fact that uh, COVID selection has a potential that's close to 100%, and they're asking us to give a realistic uh, potential for COVID concentrates. It's similar, perhaps a bit higher, but it's quite similar. Now about uh, the fees in COBUS funds. At some point, you have asked that uh, those are high. You have said that those are high. So people are asking, why do you think that's the case and why don't you reduce them? Well, we're not going to talk about high or low. What is the Sesame Street? It's clear what we say when we mean that uh, they're high. And if they're high, we know what the road ahead of us needs to be like. But we see what happens. They're asking us about Scorpio tankers. Is it an interesting company? I will give you the floor. Well, as you've seen, we've analyzed most companies in the shipping sector. It's very interesting, but they have a very high debt. But they have a very new fleet. 
So they are right there in the turning point. But we have very good companies, and it wasn't really necessary for us to um, dive into this empty pool. They have very good uh, management. They've done a good job in previous companies, and uh, we know that uh, and they're going to possibly do quite well, but they have a very high debt. But if the cycle is extended, more than expected, they will have to do something to extend their lifespan, and they will be successful. But we have some other simpler choices. As you've seen, we've invested a lot in shipping, but we are not going into companies that have a significant debt risk, and the ones in our portfolio have a uh, debt that is under control. Even though it seems like TK uh, has a higher debt, it's very well under control. And we also wanted to focus on certain subsectors. You cannot just get to the world of shipping and get to know all subsegments because each subsegment has different dynamics. And Scorpio works with uh, uh, fuel and um, um, gasoline and byproducts. They're not the same as oil. It's just like when we were talking about uh, dry loads. Well, what we're trying to do is to focus on those that we consider we can get to know better and control better, but we don't want to spread ourselves too thin. Babcock. They have lost half of their capitalization. Nevertheless, since 2014, the revenue, the profit is increasing. Well, Juan Cuantos uh, can talk about Babcock a little bit more. Well, as you said, Paco, Brexit has had an impact on many companies in the UK, and ultimately the analysis is quite fun because you take everything that they do, you see how much uh, Brexit could impact them, you assume prices, how much is everything's worth, and you do your math, and you see that the value is approximately double. So we remain invested. The advantage that we have in value is that we know how much it's worth. So uh, when the price goes down, it's either you maintain your position or you buy more. Reasons? Well, what are the reasons? Some people are afraid. And when people are afraid, they do silly things and they sell things very cheap. So we take that opportunity and we buy more. For those of you who don't know it, uh, Babco is maintaining the Royal Navy. Some people think that with the cutbacks in uh, the British in the British budget, they're going to uh, keep uh, the uh, nuclear submarines in their harbors and so on. But that doesn't make sense. An investor is asking about whether we are afraid that the bad whether the bad results in this year, since there's no reimbursement committee, will be translated into a um, leak of investors. Since the 1st of January, most investors, well, since November, most investors are uh, one year old at least. Uh, we've had net incomes every single day. If some investors decide to leave, that's fine. We have a very liquid portfolio with uh, very big stocks, very liquid, and that shouldn't be a problem. Can you make a comment about Charlie Munger's sentence, which is that the profitability on stocks for a very uh, long term is similar to the ROSI for those companies? Well, they're quite right. You're buying at a discount, but the business quality is what provides profitability in the long term. This is why we try to purchase companies that have a 20% uh, return on capital on average, because if you buy it on accounting value, this, that's going to give you a return after a few years. They're asking us about the perspectives for Ferrovial and Repsol. What's the outlook? Well, we met with Repsol one week ago. Vicente, do you want to talk about Repsol? 
It's actually a company that we consider very interesting. What we actually like is that it's quite uh, resistant in the cycle because they have a very good downstream business. And when the oil prices go down, they still produce very good profit. And also, um, we like it because it's not really all that cheap. It's a 10 time uh, profit. They have uh, undertaken a divestment plan in the last few years and the cost reduction plan in the past few years. And uh, we think that the management is uh, highly focused, so we are quite comfortable with their investment thesis. Uh, Ivan, do you want to add to that? Well, actually, in Ferrovial, approximately 50-something percent of the um, uh, appraisal depends on uh, a highway that could be the best concession, the best contact, contact uh, granted in the world. And uh, fees have been increasing in the last few years, and traffic hasn't taken the impact. And uh, perhaps the behavior of the dollar has hurt it a little bit, but uh, the concession will last until uh, 2099, if I'm not wrong, and we think that the company is going to implement or continue to implement new ways to increase fees to maintain traffic, but additionally they will be more efficient in income. And in the past few years they have invested in other concessions which are just as good as the one in Canada. They've done so in the US and they're starting the ramp up. So the outlook there is quite good. And last year they were hurt also by the dollar, but in general terms the business is going quite well, both in the U.S. as well as in Canada. And they also have part of the uh, Heathrow airport, and perhaps it's the best airport in the world. Traffic continues to increase. The pound has also hurt them, but the underlying business is doing quite well. They have been affected by the currency, but also to offset that, debt in Canada, debt in the US, debt in the UK is uh, on the local currency. Therefore, the net effect is not so relevant. But in the US, we are at 27, uh, 125, 155 for Canadian dollars. Uh, the pound is about the same levels. So I think moving forward, the increase uh, in business should be reflected on the underlying, and we shouldn't have so much problems with uh, currency risk. So we think the company is worth more. What do you think about the current appraisal of uh, Wilders Kluber? I think it's at 40 euros now, is it? Their own price. It's a company that uh, we had um, stocks for between 10 to 20 years per share, when, and we did some movements. Now they're at 40. Everything that we thought was going to happen has actually happened. The lack of growth that there was in income because they were migrating towards the digital environment because the dollar was hurting them. Well, now the situation has reverted and that now sales are increasing by 3%. And that's how the market works. When uh, you are increasing sales by 3%, you're at PR 10. And when you exceed that, all analysts uh, recommend it and uh, it goes to PR. 17 as it's the case now so it's no longer interesting for us it's uh, under very good management uh, but at uh, PR uh, 10 uh, 15 17 I don't know anyone could do that an investor is asking whether we are taking into account uh, socially responsible uh, investments either if we are investing in companies uh, that uh, could have a negative impact on the environment or uh, uh, those people that are uh, in a more difficult position. But I don't understand what having an impact on the environment is. Uh, of course, if you are doing something outrageous and you're hurting the environment, then you will be put in jail. But if you undergo an inspection and you don't end up in jail, then maybe that means that you're not doing something outrageous. For instance, Israel Chemical has had some problems with spills, and they will have to pay for that. And 
indeed uh, they will probably have an insurance company to pay for it. But we are not wiser than the law itself. Do you see any value in Logista? A company with a market cap of uh, 2.8 million, 2 million in cash, and a profit of 50 million. No, we're acquainted with Logista. It's a great company, and it may join our portfolio in a not so far away future. An investor is asking us to what extent Covas and its funds depend on one single person, Francisco García Panames. Well, Perhaps a year and a half ago, it was highly dependent, but it's obvious that this is uh, depending less and less on one single person. I don't know to what extent, but we cannot talk about percentages. But of course, every day that passes, this reality becomes more evident. And I think it's uh, obvious today, for instance. My last question would be, what three books would you recommend to someone who wants to start uh, working in the value investment world, taking into account uh, what you have learned in your professional career? Three books, can you give me a hand? What three books would you recommend? Any ideas? Because there's so many books out there. One Up on Wall Street, One Step Ahead of uh, the Stock Market by Peter Lynch. It's very interesting entertaining. Uh, it was written 30 years ago and nothing has really changed since then. So it's turned still up to date well, except for the examples, of course. Pat Dorsley, they're very simple to read. And they talk about uh, uh, competitive windows, Brazil's world, and he talks about business too. And you're right, uh, Real Finance. Federal Finance, I think he's saying. The little book of Federal Finance, I think he's saying. Well, these recommendations are quite fine because some help us approach investment and so on. Some help us analyze companies better. And some help us act correctly and develop the right behavior to invest which are books on behavior. So uh, I would touch upon the three different aspects. I've been, I think we've been here for three hours. It's time to wrap up. One last question. An investor is saying, I've concentrated all my positions in your new fund, Covas Concentrates. Do I need to start getting nervous? And I say this because I'm extremely reassured. Well, if he's extremely reassured, that makes two of us. I invested on the 1st of January, and of course, I'm in uh, red figures, um, and I don't know, he, he can be reassured. The Cobas Concentrate portfolio, it's a portfolio that selects the main values in Cobas selection. It's, there aren't any big surprises there. There's more weight for those, and we'll see what happens as uh, the values that have dropped pick up and the others further develop. Normally, profitability should increase too. So we're done then. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming here one more year. I hope this was useful and fruitful, and that you make the right decisions. And we will be delighted to see you again next year and many years to come after that. Thank you. Thank you.